surrender in a case like this. Obviously, Mr. Trump had forecasted that he would be arrested in some respect. We have no evidence that that has taken place. Uh, but the typical scenario would be for he to actually surrender at the district attorney's office. At that point, he would be processed, fingerprinted, mugshot, all of the typical processes that you would see in a regular case. Even though, of course, this is not the regular case, we do not have any timing on exactly when that processing would take place. Now, Mr. the indictment itself, will it be sealed? Will we not perhaps see the details of it for some time? It's typically sealed until a judge actually orders it to be unsealed. So it gets sealed. It's actually with the court right now. And that would specify what the actual accusation is. That's exactly. Is. That's when we will actually see the piece of paper that will actually lay out all the charges. Sometimes they go into great detail. That's known as a speaking indictment when it provides somewhat of a narrative, sort of telling the story of what happened. Sometimes it's very bare bones, and we'll have to wait and see what this one does. We have been hearing that the, the legal theory, the legal basis that the DA has been looking at is one that's un tested. Yes. What do we know about uh, what the challenge was in this case? So typically in a case like this, the falsification of business records, that's typically a misdemeanor. So we're talking just up to a year in prison. In order to elevate it, to step it up to a felony, there has to be actually a second crime and a, an intent to either commit or conceal a second crime. And throughout this entire investigation, we've all wondered, what would that second crime be? Could it be something related to state election law? Could it be something related to federal election law? We just don't know. And it's one of the things that we're going to be looking for when, in fact, this indictment gets on So sale. a question that essentially centers on how the, that money was accounted for, what it was stated to be used for, and what the intent may have been for its use. Exactly. So it's not actually the paying of the hush money that's the crime. The, the problematic here, the problematic issue here, if in fact that's what they've indicted him on, is the way that it was accounted for on the books of the Trump Organization as legal fees, when in fact it was not legal fees to Michael Cohen, his lawyer at the time. It was hush money. Again, if the former president had predicted, what, a week and a half ago that he would be arrested, obviously uh, that has not happened right now. But we do know, uh, again, from our sources, there has been an indictment. Let me go to senior Capitol Hill correspondent uh, Garrett Haig. Garrett, what can you tell us? Well, Lester, picking up that timeline from a week and a half ago after Mr. Trump's prediction a week and a half ago Saturday that he would be arrested the following Tuesday, his legal team offered a witness of their own to this grand jury, a man named Robert Costello, who had been an attorney working with Michael Cohen around the time of this alleged hush money plot. That testimony then essentially was the last moving piece we saw in this probe for another week. On Monday of this week, the grand jury heard from what we now believe was their final witness, David Pecker, the former publisher of the National Enquirer. This was Mr. Pecker's second time before the grand jury. He's a key player in all of this. He was believed to be the person who brought together Mr. Cohen and attorneys for Stormy Daniels who might have engineered or at least come up with the idea for these payments. That witness on Monday, again, believed to be the last witness this grand jury heard uh, before their decision to indict today, apparently two months to the day after being convened for the very first time on January 30th. Now, as we await additional information about about what the charges might be, I can tell you the political reaction is already coming in. Congress is headed out on a two-week recess, but already we've heard from members, and it's clear that this is going to be a polarizing decision, both in the halls of Congress and politically across the nation writ large. One Republican member of Congress calling it a dark day for the country. Uh, uh, some Democrats cheering this on as, as a victory for the rule of law. Again, Lester, so much we don't know, but the political re reverberations into 2024, the presidential election campaign will be vast. Well, of course, he has a presumption of innocence for, for now. Does that change anything in terms of him being a candidate for the 2024 election? The former president's made it clear an indictment will not change his candidacy. He will plow through it. In fact, he has made the possibility of an indictment almost a plank of his campaign platform, arguing that any indictment in New York or under, in any of the other investigations in which we know him to be a target would be, in his words, election interference, an effort, he says, by Democratic district attorneys or prosecutors with the Justice Department to do what a political process couldn't and knock him out of this race. He has been very clear on that point that he believes this is a political indictment, should one come, or should any additional indictments come, and he fully intends to continue his campaign in the face of any additional uh, legal challenges. All right, Garrett, I'll ask you to stand by. I want to go on the phone now. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos is joining us. Danny, as we understand, this uh, would be unsealed at a, at a later date in which we would learn the details of the indictment, but it, would it be your best estimate that this would be a felony indictment? 
I think most folks are predicting that this will be a felony indictment based on falsification of business records, which is a default misdemeanor in New York State, but it gets bumped up to a felony if the falsification of records was used in furtherance of or to conceal another crime. But I may be in the minority of folks that are thinking that that may be what's on the indictment, but also look out for uh, the crimes related to Trump allegedly inflating his value for the purpose of securing loans or just bragging rights and deflating his value of properties uh, when it came time to paying taxes. That, to me, still seems like a viable uh, set of charges that could appear on the indictment, even though reportedly there's been a lot of attention uh, by the grand jury on the Stormy Daniels hush money payments. This is where it gets a bit sticky here. Uh, my understanding is grand juries are secretive, that, that the information is, is close held. The fact that we know what we know now, uh, does, does it affect the defense? If, if they know, for example, that Alvin Bragg had to push this rock uphill for a ways to get this indictment, what does that signal to the defense? Exactly right. While we may not know what went on exactly in the grand jury room, we have the benefit of, for example, Mark Pomerantz, a former volunteer member of the DA's Office of New York, who wrote essentially a tell-all book that gave us a pretty good idea of what uh, the push and pull was behind closed doors, not in the grand jury room itself, but among uh, prosecutors in the DA's office. So uh, I think that you might find that that's the kind of book that gave that not only made the case for indicting Trump, but at the same time, it also, by giving the other side of the coin, the other prosecutors uh, and their arguments, uh, gave the defense a blueprint uh, for how to proceed. So these, this and other pressure may have hastened uh, this indictment, although it's difficult to say that this was a hastily put together indictment because it took literally years. So this was not something that was rushed into, although, uh, you know, many uh, have uh, questioned whether or not these are the strongest potential charges against Donald Trump. And if the stronger charges might uh, not be those in Georgia, uh, potentially, or uh, from the federal investigation uh, led by special counsel. Danny Savalas, I'll ask you to stand by as we continue our coverage. Also joining us, NBC News senior Senior Washington correspondent Hallie Jackson. Hallie, let me get your thoughts and observations. Well, a couple of things here. When you look at the political ramifications, Garrett laid it out well that this is a former president, now a current candidate who is not planning, has no intention of backing away from this 2024 race. Remember, it had long been speculated for the last several weeks at least that this indictment could in fact come down. And let me lay out how I think we will see the Trump team, not politically, but legally, try to defend the former president from this. Again, with the caveat that Laura and Danny have laid out that we do not know yet what is in the indictment specifically. But from public statements that members of the former president's legal team have made, they will probably try to argue that this was simply, as they've said before, a kind of nuisance settlement, this alleged hush money payment, basically, that this was made in the personal capacity of Donald Trump and not, in fact, uh, Michael Cohen, by the way, and not, in fact, as part of a campaign expenditure. They're going to do something else. They're going to try to portray Michael Cohen, who is a key figure, a key witness who testified repeatedly to the grand jury in this case as a liar and somebody who simply is not credible. We have seen that already from Donald Trump again and again on his platform, Truth Social. And they'll also probably point to some statements made by a former member of the previous Manhattan District Attorney's team to try to say that even some former members of this team did not think that there was enough in this case to actually prosecute. This is what we have heard from the legal representatives of former President Trump already. As far as the political impact of this, right? Uh, the base of Donald Trump has been sticky, Lester. And by that, I mean they have stuck with him through a lot of this. Remember, these hush money payment allegations came out even prior to the 2016 election, and Donald Trump still ended up in the White House here. The question that I think we'll be looking for as it relates to the 2024 campaign is what do his current Republican opponents and potential Republican opponents do and say about this. I think there's going to be a lot of eyes on Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who is considered to be the leading front-running candidate against Donald Trump in the primary, even though he hasn't even officially announced he's running yet. There's a lot of speculation that DeSantis will. How might he thread the needle on this now historic and unprecedented indictment against a former president, Lester? All right, Hallie, I'll ask you to hang in there for us. Let me go to NBC News political director and moderator of Meet the Press. Chuck Todd, Chuck, uh, how do you separate the politics or will it not be separated? They're not separated. They're very intertwined, right? This has been something, shoot, Alvin Bragg, when he was running to be 
the Democratic nominee to be the, the next pro, uh, Manhattan DA. You know, this was part of the campaign dialogue there. So this has always been intertwined with politics. And, and, and in many ways, Donald Trump has been, um, some might call it gaslighting, others might call it uh, preparing his base for this moment, arguably for years. The whole, they're always out to get me, um, realize that, that when they're coming after me, they're coming after you. And when you look at just all the various ways that this has been polled, uh, when you look at, when you talk to various Republican strategists about ways they've already polled this, like it does an indicted Donald Trump, is he weaker in the Republican primary? And it's not clear that he is. Now, the question I've always had on this is, when he, if he accumulates indictments, right, this is the first shoe to fall. If he's accumulating indictments throughout the year, does that suddenly become the weight where Republican primary voters say, hey, we like you, Donald Trump, but you can't win? That hasn't happened, though. You know, the only, can't, the only rationale I've heard a Republican try to make against Donald Trump um, without, uh, without trying to attack him has been, hey, you know, he, you know he, he's lost three times, 2018, 2020, 2022. Either he or his ideas have lost at the ballot box. You know, he's the, the, the Republican most likely to lose to Biden. But the problem is his voters don't believe it. He's convinced his voters he didn't lose in 2020. So they can't even use that argument effectively that he already lost once. So it's, it'll be interesting to see how voters react to now that he actually is indicted. And when you see the mugshot and you see all those things. But I do think we ought to judge the, the, his durability here, not after this indictment, after if, if another one comes out of Georgia and D.C., I think that's when we'll find out truly how politically durable he is. Yeah, and I've got Laura right here with me. How do we, when, what's the progress of those other investigations, which are arguably more serious charges? Well, it's interesting. So the one, obviously, in Georgia, the special grand jury produced a report. Uh, Trump's attorneys have obviously attacked that process at length, and they've tried to squash that, quash that report. Um, the district attorney there had said at some point that it was imminent, but that was really weeks ago. And so the timetable on that is not at all clear. It certainly is not um, you know, take place anywhere near as close as this one is. Um, the charges, as you mentioned, there are very different, and it has to directly do with him um, trying to get the Secretary of State of Georgia um, to invent a number of votes, obviously attacking the center of democracy. All right, I want to go to WNBC's Jonathan Deans now, who broke, uh, he's chief investigative reporter for our station here in New York. He's been covering this story from the start. Uh, Jonathan, tell us what you've learned and how this is going to play out. Our, our first hint, we should note that there was a stepped up uh, police presence downtown. What do you know? Yeah, late this afternoon, the NYPD was advised to start stepping up security as the grand jury was expected to hold a vote this afternoon. We began reporting on that, and then we heard that the grand jury was voting, and then the result came in late this afternoon. Multiple sources telling us that the grand jury has voted to indict the former president of the United States. Uh, we are told that his defense attorneys have been advised, and we are awaiting word as to when, if as early as tomorrow, he'll appear in court here in Manhattan, or will that be pushed into next week. Uh, that will be a conversation between the prosecutors and uh, the defense team. Meanwhile, we await to see uh, if and when that paperwork gets filed and then unsealed and made publicly available so we can learn details more about it. But certainly a historic day here in New York and for the nation, the former president charged here in New York in connection with that Stormy Daniels affair. All right, Jonathan Deans, thank you for that. Also with us, I'll return to NBC News senior Washington correspondent Hallie Jackson. Uh, Hallie, I understand you have heard from Michael Cohen, the former president's former fixer. Yeah, one of our producers, Adam Reese, who's been uh, among the tips of the spear on reporting the story for us, uh, has a new statement here from Michael Cohen. You say the former attorney's former fixer, yes, and that is why he is involved in this discussion over this hush money payment at all, as we have laid out here. Cohen, now we are hearing for the first from for the first time since news of this indictment against the former president broke. He says that he takes solace in validating the adage that no one is above the law, not even a former president. He goes on to say that 
it is not the end of this chapter, but the beginning of the next one. And then he says he wants to let the indictment speak for itself. And Lester, the context and the backstory there, Cohen had been very public in coming out and talking about some of the testimony in front of the grand jury, how he perceived this case, et cetera, until he was advised by his attorneys, according to sources, to basically pull back on that. He says in this statement, the only two things that he wishes to say at this time is that accountability matters. And he says, and I stand by my testimony and the evidence I have provided to the district attorney of New York, to the Manhattan district attorney there. And again, that is unsurprising, perhaps, that Michael Cohen would stand by his testimony, but it is still significant because I think you will start to see, in likely a matter of minutes, if not hours, uh, a, a an effort to try to attack Michael Cohen's credibility post-indictment, an effort that had already begun even prior to this news coming out, Lester. I know you'll be monitoring social media and some of that reaction for us, Hallie. Thank you. I want to go to the White House now, Peter Alexander. Peter, there's been a real curtain of silence over the last few weeks yeah. as this, we seem to be marching toward this moment. Anything you're hearing there now? Yeah, Lester, we have now received the official no comment from those at the White House. The president on this topic has kept silent. Uh, he's really done his best to try to steer clear of this entire conversation for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is there are a series of temptations and pitfalls that would make this a thorny issue for any president of the United States to witness their predecessor, the former president of the United States, now being indicted. The White House wants to be very careful that it's not construed that any comment they would make on this topic, any comment by President Biden would be viewed as an effort to try to tip the scales or to lean on Merrick Garland, the attorney general of the United States, who ultimately will be the one who decides whether or not to prosecute the former former President Donald Trump as part of that federal investigation led by the special counsel Jack Smith that is taking place right now into a series of different issues, some stemming from the handling of classified information by the former president, also uh, his handling as it led up to the January 6th attacks, his handling of the 2020 election results. So that's the position here. The White House has directed uh, us as we have reached out to the Democratic National Committee as well for any comment. None from them here, but there certainly is a desire to try not to, to watch this as it unfolds, according to those close to the president and top Democrats, not to politicize it in any way. And it's notable that we have seen from the president a real focus on the issues and away from the politics here, trying to focus specifically on the economy, on his efforts as it relates to the budget. And again, as he did just yesterday when he was on the road, really criticizing Republicans on policy issues, like, as he says, their desire to cut back on Social Security and Medicare. So to be very clear, a no comment from the White House, an authority issue for this White House that they're going to try to steer clear of for the time being. That's All right, uh, Peter Alexander, thanks. We'll uh, ask you to stand by. I want to go to Danny Savalos again. Uh, Danny, you said something earlier I wanted to go back on. We have all focused on this case as being about the hush money. That is the case. If I understood you a moment ago, you're suggesting there may be other charges in here that weren't widely talked about. What are those? There could be. For example, there was plenty of investigation done into Trump's various properties, everything from 40 Wall Street to even his own apartment in Manhattan, uh, which he supposedly overstated something as simple as the square footage. Now, now the challenge there is that when it comes to valuation of real estate, that is a subjective process. And maybe it's even more subjective when you're dealing with a brand name like Donald Trump. So it's possible the DA's office may have shied away from those charges, too. But they had plenty of reasons for uh, being concerned or not thinking the Stormy Daniels hush money payments uh, would be slam dunks. Also, there are challenges with that case as well. For example, the issue of whether or not New York state prosecutors can use an alleged federal election law violation as that predicate crime that will bump up that New York state uh, misstatements or false statements on business records to a felony. It sounds kind of complicated, right. but basically yeah, the Danny, question me... is, can they use that as the felony? Uh, the, the federal election law, do they have the jurisdiction to do that? Yeah, Danny, thanks. We're going to pause briefly for some stations to start their local newscast while we continue our coverage of the indictment of former President Donald Trump. All right, we're back uh, with our viewers here. Let's turn back to our legal correspondent, Laura Jarrett. Laura, for folks just turning on the TV, walking into this, walk through what we know right now. Lester, based on what we understand right now, a state grand jury in Manhattan has voted to indict former President Donald Trump. We understand that it's based on his uh, payments by a former lawyer, Michael Cohen, uh, to a former ad adult film star, Stormy Daniels. That hush money scheme, that's what we believe is at the center of this, but I should be clear that we have not seen 
seen any indictment yet. As we understand, it is still under seal, uh, under seal at this hour. But we do have two sources uh, telling NBC that Trump's attorneys have been informed that their client has been indicted. As for the legal case here, again, we have to see the actual charges. Uh, but it is far from an open and shut case. If we believe it to be based on this falsification of business records, that's typically a misdemeanor in order to elevate it to a felony. There's really an untested legal theory about how all that would work. It's quite complicated. As for the process here, now that Trump's attorneys have been notified, we would imagine that he will um, surrender in the coming days. That's what would typically happen in a case like this, a white collar crime. The defendant gets an opportunity to surrender, would come in for processing, which in the typical case would include a mugshot, fingerprinting, a background check, and at that point, uh, they would proceed to an arraignment. Now, we should mention Trump has denied all wrongdoing in this case. He has denied an affair with Stormy Daniels adamantly up and down, and his attorneys, of course, have said he has done nothing wrong. And, and typically, I'm not going to hold, hold you to a timeline here, but typically, how long does this something like this take to get to trial? Uh, it could take quite a while, especially in a case like this. You can imagine his lawyers are going to fight tooth and nail and say their client should not have been prosecuted. This will try to file a motion to dismiss to get the charges thrown out. And so we could be in for a long haul. And it's Lester. relevant because he is a, a candidate for president sure. in 2024. Let me go back and, uh, and bring uh, our political director and moderator of Meet the Press, Chuck Todd, with us. Uh, Chuck, we talk about the arraignment and the process that the former president might have to go through. Uh, it, it's really hard to know whether it's something that he fears or he will hope to use, just based on Look, some of the statements he, we've heard lately. I, I can tell you this, and people I've talked to close to, look, he does fear all this, all right? The idea that he embraces it or celebrates it, I think, is bravado. I mean, I don't think it's bravado. I'm told by folks, look, he really does fear this. He doesn't, you know, he has spent his whole life sort of fighting uh, the law, if you will. It's been a, it's been a, arguably a part-time job of his throughout the years, either via his businesses or, uh, or recently, uh, his four ways into politics. So, you know, he's certainly comfortable. As one person described it to me, look, he stands on the edge of a cliff and doesn't fear falling, right? Other people who would have indictments, uh, even more coming, would be in a fetal position, right? That's not Donald Trump. But he does fear this. He doesn't want this. He, he doesn't, you know, he hated watching his former uh, CFO, Alan Weisselberg, uh, in handcuffs. He he doesn't want the mugshot. So, yes, he does fear all of these things almost for vanity purposes, if you will, on that front. But I'll tell you what they do plan to do. They're trying to make lemonade out of it. They're going to try to raise, I, I promise you, they'll probably raise a ton of money off of this in the next 48 hours. And it will be one of these uncomfortable moments. It's why you saw when he snapped his fingers and said, I'm going to be arrested. And I expect people to back me up on this. His vice president, Mike Pence, who may end up testifying against him in another grand jury in Washington, he backed him up on this. Ron DeSantis reluctantly backed him up on this. House Republican committee chairs started the process of trying to investigate the Manhattan DA before even knowing so did he when just, or did if he, just he would free, indict. Did he just so, freeze the Republican race? Well, I think, he's, I think his presence has frozen the race. The race was frozen because of his presence before. I mean, in many ways, you've seen there's not many other new people getting into this race. This is, maybe Ron DeSantis gets in, the assumption is he is, but there's a whole bunch of other people that look like they're not gonna go. People like the governor of Virginia, there's some, a bunch of senators that have decided not to run. Uh, let's see what Tim Scott, really the, the most active senator these days that's thinking about it. But I do think this is gonna be a smaller field. And I do think that this is the dominant story because this is what Donald Trump does. He's not gonna ignore it, right? He's gonna, one thing he does is he will lean into this and he will make it part of the campaign. Remember what he said, I am your retribution. Right, he wants his problems to become his base's problems. I, well, I think this is terrible long-term politics for him. I think it's an impossible general election for him to win, but it may be very hard to dislodge him from this nomination. Yeah, this it, in it, an odd way may solidify him as the uh, prohibitive favorite. I'm gonna throw, I'm gonna throw something out of your wheelhouse. I'm gonna talk, talk law for a minute here. You've mm -hmm. got these other two investigations, Georgia, and then of course the mm -hmm. DOJ special counsel investigation. Are they, whether they like it or not, under an accelerated timeline, given the fact that we have an election in 2024? 
They have to be. I don't think you can have these things lingering in 2024. I think Merrick Garland, in particular, is very sensitive to this. This is why he named a special counsel basically right after Trump decided to announce his, his campaign as early as he did. If you recall, last November, the second he did, he's like, all right, I have to name a special counsel because he's now an active candidate. But I, there's no doubt, I, I think that, that Merrick Garland is going to want a decision, no or no go, you know, go or no go on this in this calendar year. And I would be shocked if we get to Labor Day without some resolution on the D.C. front. All right, uh, Chuck, let me go to uh, senior Washington, Washington correspondent Hallie Jackson. Hallie, have we heard from the former president already members of the Trump family? We have heard from uh, at least his son, Eric Trump, one of his sons here, who in a new post on Truth Social, of course, the former president's social media platform says, this is third world prosecutorial misconduct. I'm quoting here. He calls it the opportunistic targeting of a political opponent in a campaign year. And Lester, this is of a piece with what you and Chuck were just talking about here. The idea that at least in a public facing way, you will see members of the Trump family. You'll see Donald Trump himself and Donald Trump's allies deliver this line that they believe this is a political witch hunt in their words. This is a refrain that we have heard for years from Donald Trump, starting when he was a candidate on the campaign trail in 2015 and 2016 up till now, uh, even through his time at the White House here. There is a sense at least again publicly from members of the Trump team that this could actually mobilize people to turn out and vote for him, to back him up because of what they see and what the former president described just recently at his first rally in Texas as the idea of the deep state essentially out to give him, uh, to get him rather. As Chuck lays out though, there has been, and I've spoken with, with sources who talk about this, very serious discussions about how to handle exactly an event like this. I think the next question is going to be, when do we see Donald Trump again, Lester? Is it going to be in Manhattan? Is it going to be at his home in Florida at Mar-a-Lago? Uh, and how will he respond? What will be that first public moment from the former president, who again is in an active campaign now for 2024 after this indictment now has apparently come down? Hallie, we heard, we heard the former president a few weeks ago predicting his, his arrest. I think it was, what, 10 days yeah. ago. Of course, it, that didn't happen. Has he, I mean, your experience covering him, has he been playing chicken with the DA, perhaps hoping that he could you know, make the DA blink and not indict? Not even the DA, Lester, the grand jurors themselves, right? He has been saying things to suggest that perhaps these grand jurors are models of bravery, if you will, and I'm paraphrasing here, for in the view of Donald Trump, uh, maybe perhaps getting cold feet, right? Because when the former president came out and said that he thought he was going to be basically perped walk perp walked on that Tuesday. Um, that was one suggestion that maybe something was happening, that maybe he had heard something. But there were two other things that had happened that had given us the sense, as far as here at NBC News and folks who are closely watching this grand jury, that perhaps this indictment was close. One is the reporting from our colleague Jonathan Deanst, who we've heard from here at NBC, that law enforcement had been preparing more security in the event that this indictment would happen. That was one of the clues. But the other big clue was that the Manhattan District Attorney had offered to Mr. Trump and his team to come and sit and speak and interview with the grand jury. That is something that typically only happens as a case is getting closer to the end. So that was an indication that maybe this case was getting close to an end. What you have seen Donald Trump try to do in the last eight, nine days, Lester, is try to turn around and say, well, if nothing happened, Maybe this means nothing's going to happen. Maybe this means the grand jury is changing their minds, et cetera. Um, I, I want to be clear here. N nobody knows that. Nobody knows that because these grand jury proceedings are intended to be secret. They are intended to be a black box. So our first real clue as to what these charges, what this indictment will be, will be when we see it, Lester. All right, Hallie, thank you. Let me go to Peter Alexander right now. Peter, we know the veil of secrecy, or, uh, of, of quietness on this, no reaction from the White House, but are you hearing anything from the Trump campaign yet? Yeah, Lester, as you were speaking to Hallie, we now just for the first time received a statement from the Trump campaign, from the CEO of what is called the Make America Great Again uh, organization here. And here's a statement from the spokesperson there who writes, this is not an indictment of a crime. There is no crime. Instead, this news is the indictment of a failed nation. He says President Trump is promising to peacefully end the war in Ukraine, dismantle the deep state and save our country by putting America first. For that, they write the political elites and power brokers have weaponized government to try and stop him. They will fail. Again, the words of a spokesperson for Donald Trump. He will be reelected 
Washington in the greatest landslide in American history, and together we will all make America great again. Those are the first words from a representative for Donald Trump now in reaction to this indictment of the former president. And Lester, as you see, it's obviously framed uh, in the same language as he has done from the very beginning, an effort to try to appear defiant uh, in this moment here, to try to cast this in the terms of election season, a political season here with the president, who obviously only a couple of weeks ago suggested uh, that he was going to be indicted. He said he would be indicted or arrested uh, on Tuesday. Obviously, that did not come to pass. There was no evidence at the time that there was any reason to believe it would happen on that Tuesday. But in the days and now weeks that have followed, the president certainly was able to parlay that into a lot of money in terms of fundraising. A new poll show as he has faced these political challenges right now. It's helped fortify his position in the Republican field with recent polls showing that he has now expanded his lead over who is expected to be his likely top challenger, Ron DeSantis, the Florida governor, though DeSantis has yet to announce a candidacy. Now more than a double digit advantage, some places showing Donald Trump with more than 50 percent support among Republicans right now to get to the points that our colleagues have been sharing. Uh, Chuck Todd among them. Again, the White House views Donald Trump as the guy they would most like to face here. They believe that he is the candidate they can most easily beat, that he is a flawed candidate, but they have avoided the temptation so far to comment on this in any way. However, they have been grateful to this point that when the president called for protests only a couple of weeks ago, very few of those protesters showed up. It really just didn't materialize. Nonetheless, it is something that this White House, this administration, is going to continue to keep its eyes on, Lester. All right, Peter, thank you. Our, our colleague Von Hilliard had a chance to, to push uh, Mr. Trump very recently on this whole issue of this impending indictment. Uh, Vaughn joins us now. What can you tell us? Yeah, Lester, this weekend, uh, coming from his Waco, Texas rally, I rode on his plane back to Palm Beach, Florida, where I had the chance to ask him a couple key questions around this potential uh, court case here. We're talking about Michael Cohen, who is alleging that back in the weeks before the 2016 election, he, inside of Donald Trump's office, as well as the CFO of the Trump Organization, Alan Weisselberg, had a conversation about paying $130,000 to store. Stormy Daniels, who was making the allegation that she had had a previous sexual relationship with Donald Trump. Trump has denied that relationship, to note. But where this ends up going is in 2017, when Donald Trump was in the White House, Lester, it was at that time in which reimbursement checks were paid uh, from Donald Trump to Michael Cohen. And so the question here that I posed to Donald Trump here this weekend was at what point was he aware that the money that he was reimbursing Michael Cohen for was going in turn to Stormy Daniels. If we are talking about a potential election law violation here, Donald Trump has suggested that he was unaware of this arrangement before the 2016 election. But prosecutors could be looking at the fact that those reimbursement checks, while he was in the White House, knowingly were going to Michael Cohen for that transaction that took place between, before the 2016 election. Donald Trump, to note, when I pressed him on that very question, he would not provide me a clear answer as to when he became aware of the Stormy Daniels, Michael a. Cohen arrangement. For Donald Trump, he, over the last two years, ever since leaving the White House, has, uh, has avoided tough questions, not only about this case, but also the January 6th Capitol attack as well as the Mar-a-Lago documents case. Donald Trump has refused to meet with prosecutors. He was presented the opportunity to go to Manhattan and sit down with the grand jury to provide his own testimony under oath. But if he had done that, he would have been under oath and would have been obligated to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. He declined that opportunity. What we now see is that this will go to a court proceeding. And at that point, it will be up to a jury to make the case on whether Donald Trump is guilty of the alleged crimes that Michael Cohen and clearly others have suggested that he made. All right, uh, Vaughn Hilliard, thank you for that insight. We're joined by former federal prosecutor and NBC News legal analyst Carol Lamb. Carol, if you could walk me through what happens next. And, I, and I'm also curious about some of that late testimony that the grand jury reportedly heard uh, over the last several days. It's always hard to speculate about what the grand jury has heard because, of course, the grand jury proceedings are secret. And so uh, nobody outside the grand jury room knows what was said inside there. But the fact that Karen McDougal, uh, there's testimony there, um, it, it indicates that the grand jury is being told about uh, what they call sort of similar acts. And, uh, and that would indicate that 
Uh, that's evidence that's introduced to show that it's more likely that the charges that are being brought against a former president actually did happen because they've happened in other contexts as well. So that's, that's uh, the best speculation I can have as to why they would have heard that testimony. All right. We want to go to um, Hallie Jackson right now. Hallie, you're hearing from the, uh, the president's camp right now. Well, his attorneys, Lester, and in this statement, it is short, it is only three sentences, but his attorneys are confirming, they say that he has been indicted. They say President Trump has been indicted. They go on to say he did not commit any crime. And then they say we will vigorously fight this, what they describe as political prosecution in court. As we are taking now what I believe uh, is a live look there at the Trump plane, clearly, in West Palm Beach in Florida, uh, as we have a network crew who is down there monitoring, obviously, what is happening at Mar-a-Lago. So not a, again, surprising statement from the Trump attorneys, Lester. We knew that they would vigorously fight this. Tr Donald Trump has long denied any wrongdoing in this particular instance. Uh, but again, significant as they confirm this indictment. What this also does here, Lester, tonight is put the Manhattan district attorney in, frankly, a white hot spotlight, one that he's already gotten a taste of. There had been, of course, threats to his office. He has had to reassure prosecutors working on his team that he would work to secure their safety. And he had been in this back and forth, he and his office, with Donald Trump's allies, not far from where I'm sitting here in Washington, on Capitol Hill, Republicans in the House of Representatives who wanted to bring Bragg in, Alvin Bragg, and have him answer questions about what they also see and what they are saying tonight, they believe is essentially a politically motivated prosecution, Lester. All right, Hallie, thanks. I want to go back to Peter Alexander. Peter, we're hearing from Stormy Daniels, uh, the actress who uh, received this hush money payment. Yeah, that's right. I want to read for you what we're hearing from Stormy Daniels, and then I want to provide for you a statement from the Democratic National Committee as well, those who will be helping lead President Biden's re-election campaign, which he hasn't formally announced, but the expectation is he would announce soon. First, from Stormy Daniels, here's a statement from her attorney who says, there is no joy in seeing this man indicted. It is a sad day, but I have to place a great deal of respect and confidence in the hard work of the grand jurors and hope going forward our justice system will apply the law to truth and fact act and recognize that no man is above the law. Those are the words of the attorney for Stormy Daniels, who really is at the center of this hush money payment that is now behind the indictment by the New York grand jury of the former president, Donald Trump. Separately to the political backdrop to all of this, as we told you, there is no comment here from the White House as they've tried to steer clear of this, not to appear in any way like they are tipping the scales in this investigation, certainly not to appear like anything they would say would be misconstrued as an effort to try to push the Attorney General Merrick Garland to prosecute uh, the former President Donald Trump as a function, as a result of the separate federal investigation by the special counsel. But the Democratic National Committee is weighing in. And in a new statement that they've provided to NBC News, they say the following, no matter what happens in Trump's upcoming legal proceedings, it's obvious the Republican Party remains firmly in the hold of Donald Trump and MAGA Republicans. The statement goes on to read, we will continue to hold Trump and all Republican candidates accountable for the extreme MAGA agenda that includes banning abortion, cutting Social Security and Medicare, and undermining free and fair elections. Lester, what's notable in all the statements we're seeing, uh, we are seeing from those on all sides of this is an effort really to try to cast this in the framing of 2024, with the real expectation being that President Biden in a re-election campaign could very likely be in a rematch against the former President Donald Trump. Obviously, this indictment has the potential to change a lot of things, but a lot of them trying to frame this, the Democrats, as we're not focused on the indictment. We're focused on the Republicans' extreme policies as they describe them. Donald Trump and his allies and aides describing this as, in effect, another effort to try to push out a political opponent here. Now we'll just watch the proceedings as they play out. All right, Peter Alexander, thanks. Let me bring back Danny Savalos, now our legal analyst. Uh, Danny, now that his attorneys have, have publicly acknowledged that this indictment has gone down, it, it's perhaps fair to ask, looking forward several steps, if he is ultimately found guilty, can he continue, can he legally continue, constitutionally continue to be a candidate for president or a president again? This is a fascinating constitutional question. The Constitution obviously is silent about this, but there are legal opinions followed by the Justice Department that says that a sitting president is immune from prosecution. But what about the candidate uh, who, is, who is not immune from prosecution? What happens if 
he is elected while he's either uh, convicted or even imprisoned. What happens then? Because the entire purpose of presidential immunity while he's in office is that the president is unlike any other person in American government. You could indict a justice of the Supreme Court and the court could continue its business. You can indict a congressman and Congress could continue its business. But arguably, uh, if you indict the president, he is the head of the executive branch and you literally and figuratively maybe arresting the executive branch. And some say, well, no, the vice president can jump in. That's not how it works constitutionally. None of those mechanisms spring into play if he's just arrested and sitting in a jail cell. Uh, the 25th Amendment doesn't come in, although I imagine that would happen or in it possibly could happen another way. So it's a fascinating constitutional question. What happens when a candidate is under indictment and if he's convicted? It may be a moot question because there is no mandatory minimum uh, if he's charged in New York with the charges that uh, most folks are expecting related to falsification of business records. Uh, so it's possible he could get a straight probation sentence. But, I mean, at the same time, if there is an incarceration sentence at all, and he is the then president of the United States, you run into a really difficult uh, constitutional issue. And it's probably the case that a state authority cannot jail a federal, the, the uh, head of the federal executive branch for the same reason that a president is constitutionally immune while he's sitting, uh, while he's currently serving as president. But again, that's not in the pages of the Constitution. That is the interpretation that has traditionally been followed by the Justice Department. All right, Danny, thanks. Let me bring back uh, Howie Jackson. Howie, I just uh, received, I think you're looking at the same thing, a statement yeah. uh, from Mr. Trump. I haven't had a chance to go through it to give us the highlights. Well, it's rather lengthy. It's, I think, five or six paragraphs here, Lester. So I will give you just the highlights here. Um, and again, this is coming from the former president himself. So this is a statement from Donald Trump calling this indictment political persecution and election interference at the highest level in history. He goes on to talk about how he has felt uh, essentially aggrieved since the day he came down that golden escalator at Trump Tower. Um, he claims that the, the Democrats, as he put it, have done the unthinkable. They say indicting a completely innocent person in an act of blatant election interference. Again, I'm quoting from the former president's statement that is just into us here at NBC News in about the last 60 seconds. He goes on to say that the Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg is a disgrace. He goes on to slam him, suggesting he is doing President Biden's dirty work. And then goes on to say that he believes this witch hunt will backfire massively on Joe Biden. He says, we will first defeat Alvin Bragg, then we will defeat Joe Biden. He says, and we are gonna throw every last one of these crooked Democrats, he says, out of office to make America great again. What I read several times for Lester to try to get any insight on, because frankly, this, is, this statement is of a piece as to what we have heard from the former president in the last week and a half or so, ever since the drumbeat of a potential indictment began to get louder. Obviously, it is significant that he is declaring himself innocent, completely innocent, as this indictment has now come out and his lawyers have confirmed that the president, the former president, has been indicted. What I don't see in this statement is what comes next for him. If he will get on that plane we just showed and head to New York to essentially uh, surrender himself if the negotiations are happening between his team and the Manhattan District Attorney's team and to what unfolds in the next maybe 24, 48 hours or so, uh, I imagine that we will continue to get more on that. We are certainly going to pursue that line of reporting, Lester, but that will be significant. There had been no real indication that the former president would try to resist the legal machinations here, and you heard that somewhat alluded to by his attorneys, who suggested that they will vigorously defend this, they will vigorously fight this in court. Um, so we will see where the former president goes and what he does next, Lester. All right. Uh, Laura Jarrett is here. Laura, does the, uh, Mr. Trump have to be careful of what he says about Alvin Bragg? Are there yeah. statutes that that, that, that limit or draw a line between what's you know, critical and what may be perceived as threatening. Well, yeah, sure. This comes up a lot in terms of defendants having the right to vigorously uh, assert their innocence, but there is a difference between asserting, asserting your innocence and attacking, um, obviously, a prosecutor and the person who is bringing the case against you. Obviously, we saw that social media post, I believe it was last week, where he had a bat in hand and mm -hmm. Alvin Bragg's picture on the other side. It was eventually taken down, but many people pointed out um, that that could be problematic problematic, when, especially if, in fact, he was indicted facing a judge. The judge might have feelings about that when you're talking about bail conditions. Um, so, again, that he has a First Amendment right, obviously, to be as free as he wants to be in his speech and defend himself. But there is a line uh, that you do have to be careful about, obviously, making threats against um, 
a prosecutor. Is it clear to you how this is going to play out now? I mean, how far along before we would see the actual indictment and the process of enraiment and, and photographs, et cetera? Uh, usually it moves pretty quickly. I would imagine that the prosecutors are negotiating with his lawyers behind the scenes about when exactly a surrender would happen. But I imagine they don't want to waste much time here and they would want to bring him in pretty quickly. And the period of time from when he would actually get processed to arraignment would usually be pretty quickly as well. But again, you know, this is an unprecedented situation right it right certainly now. is uh, I'm gonna go to Chuck Todd again Chuck I'm looking at the Trump statement and he links right. it all together Russia 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 yeah. the Mueller hoax Ukraine 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 impeachment hoax impeachment hoax the illegal and unconstitutional Mar-a-Lago raid and now this uh, is that what you would expect that that all this will become part of one narrative well that's what he's been doing and, and it's worked for him if you think about it over the last eight um, what are we at seven years now uh, if you if you start with the Russia investigation, he has really conditioned his supporters on this. He links them together. He has always done so. So I think this is why, you know, I'll constantly have people who are not fully uh, informed about our current uh, uh, political system, if you will, and they'll say none of this. Imp I I don't understand. And it's like, look, he has done. This is a years-long campaign, and again, I would describe it as, you could call it conditioning, you can call it gaslighting, but he has successfully, I think, at least with his core supporters, made them think that any investigation, any allegation of wrongdoing is just part of the attempt to stop Donald Trump. Uh, on one hand, it's, you know, it, look, it, it, it's the mark... There have been many a successful and unsuccessful authoritarian leader or want to be authoritarian leader in our history that has done this themselves. And, and it, you can find some political success doing this for a while. But uh, on this one, I think this is why this really is going to freeze this GOP race for a while. Yeah, but you know, I, I, I have to say, I look at this and if I were Ron DeSantis, I would not get into this race until the fall. Because there is no use at all doing anything active on the campaign trail while these, while there is an active indictment, there's probably going to be one or two more that come down on him, uh, on either the classified documents or what's happening in Georgia. And I think they're all going to get litigated and dealt with over the next three to six months. It, it may be that this race really doesn't start anew until we know where these inv indictments are going. And if you're a, another candidate, you might as well just stay under the radar and really not get into this thing. It, it would seem, though, that there are those on the left, those who are against Trump, who will be celebrating, if not quietly celebrating mm -hmm. this news. But at the same time, is there going to be a sense of, we wish it wasn't this one to kick it off? <laughs> Look, there's a ton of that. I, I've, I'm hearing this constantly from sort of the, the more strategic side of the Democratic Party that are just like, uh, you know, this is the wrong one to lead with. This is going to make it easier for Trump to sort of conflate this one, which there is plenty of legal debate about whether this is even a felony charge or not. You know, it, it, would, would it, you know, is it a misdemeanor and all of that? When the other two cases, I think, are both um, appear to be have appear to be stronger. Number one, um, but also seem more consequential. I mean, whatever you whatever you think of Donald Trump. And Stormy Daniels, you know, there's there's plenty of of political analysts who will who, who would argue that the country made its decision on this stuff back with Bill Clinton and 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 that and Monica Lewinsky, and essentially going, we don't like the behavior and we don't like the weaponization of it or trying to to drag this into the courts, right? It, and so right. I think that that's I think that's why there's so many Democratic strategists that are like. Ooh, cringing that this is the first one. All right, Chuck Todd. Chuck, thank you. That concludes this NBC News special report. Much more this evening on Nightly News. This evening, for many of you, that starts right now here on NBC. We are picking up here on NBC News now with that historic breaking news that you have watched unfold right here over the course of the last 60 minutes. A Manhattan grand jury voting to indict former President Donald Trump, a moment we have never seen, the first time ever that a former president has been indicted for a crime. We expect the Manhattan District Attorney, Alvin Bragg, to unseal this indictment at some point soon. We do not know specifically when. 
It's not clear whether or not the former president is going to surrender to Manhattan officials when that could happen. And we are hearing a lot from him, from his allies, and from folks on the other side of the aisle. First, from Donald Trump himself. He is tonight calling this a witch hunt, saying that he has felt aggrieved essentially since the moment he ran for president in 2016, describing this indictment as election interference, declaring himself completely innocent. His attorneys are also out with the statement, in essence, confirming this indictment, saying that they will vigorously fight this political prosecution in court. That is also what we're hearing from Mr. Trump's 2024 campaign, because remember, he is not just a former president now indicted, he is a current presidential candidate who has declared that he will continue to run for office even if this indictment were to come down. He has no plans, he has said, to get out of this race anytime soon. A spokesperson says this is the indictment of a failed nation. Remember what this case is about, an alleged hush money payment made back in 2016, before the 2016 election, an agreement to pay former adult film star Stormy Daniels. Her lawyer says this indictment is no cause for joy, but that no one is above the law. One of the key witnesses in this case is the former attorney's former fixer, a guy named Michael Cohen, you see him here. Cohen was a key witness to the grand jury. He is somebody who he says facilitated that hush money payment and testified against the former president. He says the indictment speaks for itself. We have a team on the ground from Florida to New York and beyond. And I wanna start with Dasha Burns, who is outside the former president's home in West Palm Beach, Florida. Dasha, the question now, right, is what happens from here? Because you are seeing the former president his allies, his family, his attorneys coming around him, rallying around him and saying this is a politically motivated prosecution. Of course, we don't know specifically what this indictment says, um, Dasha, because it has not been unsealed yet. We presume that it is related yeah. to that specific hush money charge. Tell us what the expectation is from the former president as he is presumably at his home in Mar-a-Lago, one would think, working the phones with attorneys, allies and others. Yeah, we believe these statements that are coming out, they, they are being written from a, a war room somewhere in Mar-a-Lago right now. We haven't seen any movement uh, there just yet, Hallie. But you're right, we don't yet know what the charges are exactly. We don't know when we will see Mr. Trump in a courtroom. But we did sort of expect this kind of response, right? This is the drumbeat that he has been beating leading up to this expected uh, indictment. We have been waiting for this moment. Moment. Although now that it is here, it is historic. Like you said, Hallie, not only because this is the first time a former president has been indicted, but because it, he is currently a candidate, right? A third time candidate for president. And we can't forget that because this next election is so important as a backdrop. And, and because, look, we're seeing in these statements right now, both from him, from his attorneys and from his allies, uh, this trend that because began really in 2015 of this chipping away at trust in the institutions, the continued pattern of uh, claiming that all of these institutions, whether it's the FBI, whether it's the Department of Justice, whether it's the legal system uh, being politicized, being weaponized and used uh, against a former President Donald Trump. And that is going to be uh, his line of, of, as if, if the trend continues, if, if, if what we're yeah. seeing, if the pattern keeps going the way it is, that's what we're going to see all the way uh, to November 2024. Because also, as you said, it's I, I don't think we're going to see him dropping out of this race anytime soon. And Hallie, I did check in with some voters over the course of this week as we were anticipating a possible indictment. And I asked, you know, uh, does that possibility make you more or less supportive of him. I asked some Republican voters this, and most of them said either, you know what, I could care less about this, or, you know what, it actually makes me more supportive because I feel like people have been coming after this guy and I wanna I wanna defend him because this is this is ridiculous. And look, this is this is what he even said in his interview on Sean Hannity. He said, I think yeah. this could actually help me. So politically, you know, this this might not be such a bad thing for the former president, Hallie.
Dasha Burns, that of course is what his team is suggesting. That is what they've been suggesting now for weeks. I want to bring in our NBC News justice and intelligence correspondent, Ken Delaney. And so Ken, Dasha has laid out politically where things stand. Talk about where things go legally and frankly from a security perspective here. Because up in New York, they're going to presumably begin preparing for security reasons. We know that the Secret Service has started those conversations. We also know that whenever Alvin Bragg, the Manhattan District Attorney, unseals this indictment, it is going to be significant. It's possible we could see other charges. That's right, Hallie. And our colleague Jonathan Deans of WNBC has already reported that the NYPD and other agencies have already started to get ready for any potential security disruption that stems from this indictment. But let me walk you through what, what we believe this legal case is all about. At, the, at its core, it's about what Donald Trump's own lawyers have acknowledged were hush money payments to this former porn star, Stormy Daniels, who was claiming that she had an affair with Trump. That's a claim Donald Trump denies. Uh, and hush money payments are not themselves a crime. But the issue here is that Michael Cohen, the lawyer who paid them, billed the Trump organization for, for compensation for those payments as legal fees. So the, the, what we believe the expected charge here, at least one of the expected charges, is a charge of falsifying business records. Now, that's a misdemeanor under New York law unless it's combined with another crime. And that's where this gets really sticky. It's long been thought by legal experts that the other crime that Bragg might allege here is the, the federal crime of an illegal campaign contribution, alleging that this was designed to cover this embarrassing matter up right on the eve when Donald Trump was beginning his 2016 presidential campaign. $130,000 is an illegal campaign contribution. It exceeds federal contribution limits. But that is a tough case. That, that combination of charges has never been brought before, Hallie. And there's also been some talk that Bragg may go in a different direction. He may allege a, a violation right. of state campaign finance law. New York has a very interesting and unique campaign finance law that makes it illegal to, uh, that makes a federal violation a state violation. The bottom line here, though, is that it's important to know that the federal government, the Southern District of New York, the prosecutors in that office, took, took a look at this case when Trump was president. Obviously, they couldn't indict him then. There's also been some reporting. They took another look at it after he left office and still declined to prosecute. They had concerns about this case. This is not a slam dunk. It's something that legal experts are going to chew on. We need to wait and see what's actually in the indictment. Uh, but um, we're in for a long legal saga here in this case. Allie. When might we see it, Ken? Do we know? Do we have any sense? It, no, we don't know for sure, but if they've just voted, generally it takes from a few hours to a few days for the indictment to be unsealed. Ken, stand by if you can. I want to bring in former U.S. Attorney Barbara McQuaid, who understands what these machinations are like, how this works once a grand jury does vote on an indictment like this. What will you be looking for once it is unsealed, Barbara? And what else should we know about this? Well, as Ken said, one thing that's really important, I think, is to look at the actual language of the indictment. There has been lots and lots of speculation about what this might be. Of course, the, the uh, falsification of the business records is just sort of the, the first crime that's the misdemeanor. What I think will be really interesting is the uh, other crime that is alleged to have been concealed, whatever that felony might be, because there are a lot of options here. Uh, as we know from the civil case that uh, 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 Letitia James has brought, the attorney general, of the state of New York, there are all kinds of allegations of business fraud by Donald Trump. And so it could be something other than a campaign finance violation. So I think that's really important. Um, I think we're going to hear an awful lot of, from Donald Trump as we have already about how this is all politically motivated. I think he is going to rile up people out there. He may not know who or when, but I worry that someone will uh, take this as a call to arms. And so I think for that reason, law enforcement needs to be at the ready for someone who might hear about this and decide to take matters into their own hands and engage in vigilante violence. Of course, the potential for threats, Barbara, has been something that is on the radar of the Manhattan District Attorney of Alvin Bragg after he received uh, essentially an envelope containing a death threat, containing a powder that was later found to be not hazardous. He pledged to his prosecutors, to his team in Manhattan, that he would do everything he can to keep them safe. Barbara, stand by because I want to go to Ryan Nobles, who is live for us on Capitol Hill. And Ryan, as this news is starting to come out, we are hearing from 
the president's sons, uh, Eric Trump and Donald Trump Jr. Eric Trump is calling this, in his view, a third world piece of prosecutorial misconduct. I'm quoting here, the opportunistic targeting of a political opponent. I have to imagine that allies of Mr. Trump on Capitol Hill, where you are standing, are echoing that thought. What are we hearing from them and frankly from Democrats here on this historic evening? Yeah, it's really remarkable, Hallie, because this indictment, uh, basically, at least the news of this indictment leaked out uh, within minutes, I, I want to say, of most members of Congress leaving Washington for an extended recess. They're going to be out of town now for the next two weeks. Uh, but within minutes of that indictment news coming out, a flurry of statements uh, via Twitter, uh, via our inboxes came flooding in from both Republicans and Democrats responding uh, to the news of the former president now facing this legal trouble. Uh, as you might imagine, it is falling very much along partisan lines. Uh, the most notable uh, members uh, that I'd like to point out, Steve Scalise, who is, of course, the House Majority Leader. This would be the second ranking Republican in the House of Representatives. He called it uh, a sham. He said the New York indictment of President Donald Trump is one of the clearest examples of extremist Democrats weaponizing government to attack their political opponents, and he called it outrageous. Elise Stefanik, who is the Republican conference chair, essentially a fourth in line for House Republicans, uh, and one of Donald Trump's biggest backers has already endorsed him for president in 2024. Uh, she also calls it a sham uh, and says uh, that uh, it's an unprecedented example of election interference. On the Democratic side, we've seen a remarkably different tone. Uh, there are some Democrats that have just, you know, tweeted out the news uh, with an exclamation point. Uh, Representative Ilan Omar, for instance, of Minnesota, who's a big critic of Donald Trump's. Uh, but we've also seen other Democrats simply say that this is the rule of law in action and that specifically no one is above the law. So uh, this is about what we in expected would happen. They've been forecasting this for several weeks. Many Republicans, particularly House Republicans, have been very critical of the district attorney's actions. In fact, they've gotten to the point where their various committees, the House Oversight and Judiciary Committee, the House Administration Committee, sending letters to DA Alvin Bragg demanding information of, about his investigation, calling for him to come here to Washington for a transcribed interview. So there's no doubt, uh, Hallie, that Republicans in Congress are going to have Donald Trump's back. Uh, but as this process plays out, we're going to have to see how far that support uh, they are willing to take. Ryan, thanks. Stand by. Let me bring in NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Danny, the key point here is that while we know that there is an indictment now, that this Manhattan grand jury has voted to indict former President Trump, again, something we have never seen happen before, we don't know specifically what that indictment says. Do you expect it to be a felony charge? Yes, for a couple different reasons. Number one, in addition to the Stormy Daniels payments, there are potential charges uh, that we haven't talked much about uh, that Donald Trump allegedly inflated his value for securing loans or bragging rights and deflated his value uh, in statements of financial uh, conditions uh, in order to avoid taxes. That could be problematic. There are defenses, potential defenses, but we may see those in the indictment as well. And if we're talking about the dollar amounts uh, of millions of dollars, that would bump it up almost automatically to a felony. The second reason is, if the only charges are related to the Stormy Daniels hush payments, yes, it's true that the default falsification of business records in New York is a felony, it would be a really bad idea to indict Donald Trump on a misdemeanor only. So mm. it's likely that uh, Alvin Bragg, to make this meaningful, would indict only because he believes there is a felony and that felony exists under falsification law if the falsification is done in order to conceal or further some other crime. Now, whether or not the DA's office can actually use a federal election law violation as that predicate crime remains to be seen. seen. There's some authority that says it could and some authority that says that may not be the case. But if that is the predicate crime, look for the defense to fight that hard and early and try to get it tossed. How? Well, here's, I'll give you an example. Uh, one argument would be that 
Uh, because New York State is a state prosecutor, uh, state prosecution, it doesn't have the jurisdiction to prosecute federal crimes. It's not prosecuting a federal election law violation, but it kind of is if it's using that federal election law violation to bump up a New York State misdemeanor to a felony. There's no clear answer on this, and there is authority saying that they can do it, but it's just not crystal clear. And anything that's not crystal clear, to me as a criminal defense attorney, that's something you got to fight. You got to put in a motion, try to throw it out. Judges hate throwing out criminal charges. They, you don't want to be the judge that throws out, that denies New York State, uh, prosecute the DA's office, uh, their day in court. Uh, you'd rather, it's the safer move to just let everything go to trial. But it is a possibility that this could get thrown out if it's a felony and if it's based on federal election law. Danny, stand by. I want to bring in senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell. And Kelly, I have to imagine that the White House, President Biden, doesn't feel like they need to say a lot here at this moment. No comment, right? And I, I wonder if we expect it to stay that way. Well, certainly for the time being, the White House, when we spoke to advisors and we went back into some of the areas where advisors were taking in this news as we were all learning it together, uh, there is a posture that there is nothing to be gained for the Biden White House to weigh in on this. And we've seen that for some period of time where they've referred any questions relating to any of the Trump legal matters to the Department of Justice or to uh, outside counsel. And today they also directed us to the Democratic National Committee. And the DNC did issue a statement talking about uh, the concerns of uh, the political party that, of course, Joe Biden, as president of the United States, is the head of and is uh, we would expect him to be a candidate for reelection. And of course, Donald Trump in this context is also a candidate in 2024. So you've got not only a president and a former president, but you have possibly a rematch of these two individuals, uh, depending on what happens through the primary process and so on. So this is is one of those situations where, again, outside events uh, are controlling a narrative that the Biden White House uh, is having to be sort of a bystander here. They have their own issues, their own serious concerns that are taking place and taking the oxygen for the president. He is expected to travel tomorrow to Mississippi uh, to deal with uh, what people have been going through there with uh, the terrible uh, storms, also dealing with uh, the news we saw today with a Wall Street Journal reporter in Russia who has been taken into custody and accused of espionage crimes. Uh, the Wall Street Journal, of course, saying he is a journalist accredited in Russia and that that is completely untrue. Uh, and that's just two things going on in this moment. So politically, this is uh, certainly something that presents challenges for this White House, which wants to uh, project an image that it is not politicizing the Department of Justice, in part, in contrast to Donald Trump when he was in office, uh, because they believed that he was very much trying to use the arms of government as extensions of what uh, Donald Trump needed for his own aims. That's how they view it, and they're trying to separate uh, very much themselves. Now, politically, we know that there are those on the left who view this as uh, no one is above the law, and if there are uh, charges against the president that will be yeah. revealed through this indictment, that that is one way of interpreting this. And then those who support the former president who see this as uh, a way to further politicize our politics and to inject politics where they shouldn't be. Uh, he, the former president has been using his truth social in addition to the formal statement he put out, kind of echoing again uh, the same themes that he uh, was talking about in his formal statement. I suspect we'll see a lot more of that uh, because, as you and I both know, the former president, uh, he likes to communicate directly and all of those emotions come out on the platform that he likes to control. Hallie? Kelly O'Donnell. Kelly, thank you so much. Live for us there outside the White House. I want to bring back in Ken Delaney in here. Ken, we are just hearing on camera now, or at least the audio of the former uh, president's son, Donald Trump Jr. I want to play a bit of that for the audience here. Apparently, you know, Soros to back Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg is actually indicting my father. So let's be clear, folks. This is like communist level shit. This is stuff that would make Mao, Stalin, uh, Pol Pot, it would make them blush. 
Okay, so that is the former president's son, Donald Trump Jr., on this Rumble show that he has, apparently finding out right as he was coming on that his father had been indicted by this Manhattan grand jury. The person at the center of that indictment, Ken, presumably one of the key witnesses, is Michael Cohen. We talked about him a couple of minutes ago when we were coming on the air here with this breaking news. He is the former fixer, the former attorney for Donald Trump, who was involved in making that alleged hush money payment, then testified against the former president. The former president's defense team will try to call into question Michael Cohen's credibility. But Cohen tonight, we are just hearing from him late tonight. He is basically saying, I stand by everything that I said to that grand jury. Yeah, that's right, Hallie. He is the central witness in the case. His credibility will be challenged. He pleaded guilty to lying to Congress and other felonies. And that's always been the issue with this case and why some legal experts think it's not the strongest case of all the legal peril that Donald Trump is facing. But at the same time, Cohen has come completely clean, as he as he would tell you, and, and, and has, has decided to unburden himself and tell the truth. And, and clearly this grand jury believed yeah. him uh, because they voted to indict uh, the former president. When you, and, and when you Ken. listen to those strident comments from the sun, you should remember that whatever this thing was, it was the project of the product of a legal process under the laws of the state of New York, Allie. Ken, I'm sorry to interrupt you there, but we have a significant piece of breaking news coming into us now from our team who is covering uh, all of this because it answers a key question that we had. Is Donald Trump going to surrender? Will he turn himself in in Manhattan? It appears tonight that the answer to that is yes and that it is going to happen early next week, according to his attorney, Joe Takapina, speaking with uh, one of our colleagues here at NBC News, that he will surrender to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office early next week. That is backed up by what we're hearing from a couple of other sources who say that his attorneys are already in touch with prosecutors. Let me bring in one of our NBC News correspondents, Garrett Hake, who covers all things Donald Trump for us here. And Garrett, this is the answer to a key question that we have had now ever since we learned that the grand jury has voted to indict. Yeah, Hallie, the question goes back much further than that. And in fact, we yeah. know these conversations go back much further than that. Uh, Joe Takapina, who's Mr. Trump's uh, one of his two attorneys in New York City, has said that they've had some conversations with the DA's office about logistics for how this would work for an arraignment going back weeks. I, I think people need to set their expectations accordingly for this, because I think the reality is you're about to see something of a both a legal and a political spectacle, the likes of which we have probably never seen in this country. If there's a if there's a a negotiated surrender of Donald Trump coming up from Palm Beach from presumably LaGuardia or Teterboro or another New York City airport through lower Manhattan to that DJ's office, I think you're going to see an unprecedented political circus that'll end with an arraignment process that's much like that that anyone else charged with a crime in New York City would face. He'll be fingerprinted, uh, he'll have his mugshot taken, he'll have his cheek swabbed for DNA. We won't see any of that, but he'll go through all of it accompanied by his Secret Service detail, and then he'll appear before a judge for an arraignment. Again, that part, just like anyone else you might see in, uh, you know, charged with any particular crime on the island of Manhattan. So it, this is gonna be a fairly extraordinary moment legally and politically, because the former president's been priming his supporters for this moment for weeks. I mean, from the moment that he first predicted his arrest almost two weeks ago now, he has tried to make this moment a key moment, not just for him personally and legally, but for his political campaign. He's sent out dozens, if not hundreds by this point, of fundraising emails from his campaign. I'm holding the latest one right now, urging his, his supporters to help donate to fight the witch hunt and make America great again. So uh, the idea that Donald Trump is being persecuted, not just prosecuted, but persecuted, is central to his political brand and the, the appeal that he has to his supporters, never more so than now, and I suspect never more so on such a big stage than what we're going to see if and when that arraignment happens, as his attorneys suggest it will, early next week. Garrett, hey, Garrett, stand by for us here. I want to bring in somebody who knows a thing or two about, well, I don't know about this, Chuck, but at least about some of the political dynamics here. Our political director, Chuck Todd, um, significant news that we're getting even in just the last three minutes here, that Donald mm -hmm. Trump is not going to try to resist this, at least not, um, mm -hmm. you know, right. from the in-person perspective of it. He will fight. He will fight to defend himself, but he's going to go. He's going to turn himself in. We're now right. learning. No, it's what Garrett said. I mean, they, look, they made a decision, as we know, 
The idea that he's looking forward to this is overstating things. He doesn't want to be handcuffed. He doesn't right. want all those things. No, However, but this is a guy, can I just say, right. from having covered him, yeah. he cares about his legacy. That's right. He does. He he is in some ways right. He always wants to be still portrayed well on the, in the New York Times and well on NBC News, right? He cares about these things. So he's not happy about this. However, they do believe politically that if they're going to deal with the first indictment, this was the one to deal with Manhattan because they thought that they can essentially do what they're doing right now. Make this the focal point, mm -hmm. make create this uh, idea that the entire party's behind him and defending him. And he's gotten some, certainly some of the bigger names of the party to all sort of support him on this one, right? Not on the other ones, mm -hmm. but on this one. And I think they think they can successfully defang the other two. That doesn't mean they won't legally be problematic for him, but politically be able to do it. And it's a strategy that was similar to the Steele dossier. You know, the, the, Mueller, the Mueller report and the Russia uh, probe was a very serious probe that found a lot of wrongdoing by his campaign and by him. But because they were able to discredit the Steele dossier, which was an irresponsibly posted piece of uh, a decision by a couple of journalistic outlets, by discrediting that, he was able to conflate it with everything else, and it did have an impact. So this is, you know, this in some way, this was not, this is not like, I'm not saying that they're in, they were looking forward to this indictment, but this is the lemonade for their campaign that they think they can make here. And I think they're right. If there was going to be one of them to drop, they would have preferred they would have, this, this is the one order. first. That's this right. Is the this order. is what they would have wanted, and they're getting it. You mentioned something important. You talked about the biggest names in the party now. Mm -hmm. Our Ryan Nobles on Capitol Hill, I believe, has some new reaction in from the biggest name in the House of Representatives on the Republican side, and that's Speaker Kevin McCarthy. What's he saying? Yeah, that's right, Hallie. And it is a full-throated uh, endorsement of support for Donald Trump mm. and an attack on the Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg. This is uh, directly from Kevin McCarthy. Uh, Alvin Bragg has irreparably damaged our country in an attempt to interfere in our presidential election. McCarthy goes on to say, as he routinely frees violent criminals to terrorize the public, he weaponized our sacred system of justice against President Donald Trump. The American people will not tolerate this injustice and the House of Representatives, and this is the important part of this statement, Hallie, will hold Alvin Bragg and his unprecedented abuse of power to account. And so at the same time that Kevin McCarthy is talking about an unprecedented uh, effort by the Manhattan District Attorney, he's also describing an unprecedented effort by the House of Representatives to interfere uh, in the investigation and prosecution of a local uh, ma a district attorney, in this case, the Manhattan district attorney. So uh, this more than anything shows you uh, that McCarthy and the House Republicans are solidly on the side of the former president and that they're going to use all the tools that they have at their disposal, yeah. especially uh, because they are in the majority. That allows them to do things like subpoena documents, call for witness testimony, uh, you know, control the use of the committees in the House of Representatives in the way in a way they wouldn't have been able to do had they lost the election. Uh, last fall. So this is Kevin McCarthy endorsing all of those different factions yeah. and different ways that House Republicans can support uh, Donald Trump. Hallie. Chuck. That's good news for Donald Trump and bad news for the Republican Party. Kevin McCarthy tying the entire House Republican messaging now to this. If he's vowing to do this, and we know the committee chairs that would be investigating right. Alvin Bragg. They're enthusiastic about going after Alvin Bragg. It's part of their larger issue. They want to go after some of these prosecutors. But this puts, you want to talk about a Republican Party that still doesn't have a message. You don't know what they're for. You know what they're against. If they allow their Washington agenda to be hijacked by Trump and all of this, I think they're, if you're an individual member Republican running for re-election or election in 24, that's not something you want to have. You'd like to show that you did something to improve people's lives. You don't want your congressional majority to be so focused on, on Donald. It, that is a, especially when you look at it, every time Donald Trump is an issue in a congressional race, it's usually not good for the Republican Party. So it, it's, look, I understand why House Republicans politically yeah. feel the need to stick by Trump. But if they do make it part of their agenda, it is it is a recipe to lose a general election. I want to get in Garrett Hake here for the last 30 seconds or so that we have, Garrett, on where this goes next. 
Well, look, I said, I mean, this spectacle that we're going to see next week is going to be so stunning. And I think to Chuck's point, the ship has already sailed. Kevin McCarthy put the entire Republican House Republican majority in Donald Trump's corner a week and a half ago when Trump said he would be arrested last week. You know what the House Republicans did today? They passed H.R. 1, numbered that way because they think it's the most important thing they're going to pass in this Congress. It will be forgotten the moment I finish this sentence because this is now going to be the biggest political story in this country, and they've tied themselves to it going forward. And I have to say, we've just heard from Florida Republican Governor Ron DeSantis, considered to be uh, basically the chief potential rival to Donald Trump for the 2024 nomination. He's saying uh, that his office will not assist in an extradition request, given the questionable circumstances here. Of course, that seems to me be a moot point, since a former president's attorney is confirming that Donald Trump will turn himself in. So here we are, 7 o'clock Eastern, 4 o'clock out West. The indictment of a former president, Donald Trump, we expect him to surrender in Manhattan early next week. We'll have continuing coverage right here on NBC News Now. Top story, we'll pick it up right now. And good evening. We are coming on the air tonight with that explosive breaking news. A Manhattan grand jury voting to indict former President Donald Trump, making him the first president, current or former, to face criminal charges in our nation's history. Not only that, he's also, according to several polls, the leading Republican candidate for president in 2024. There are massive legal, political, and even issues of national security all tied directly or indirectly into this indictment. This is a moment we have not seen ever in U.S. history, and it's happening right now. Tonight, we're going to break down all of it for you. There's a lot we admit that we don't know. But tonight, we have a major development in the various criminal investigations against the former president. Here's where we start. The grand jury tasked with investigating hush money payments Trump made to adult film star Stormy Daniels in the run up to the 2016 election. At this moment, the specific charges he's facing have not yet been unsealed. Trump, who's in the middle of his third presidential campaign, within minutes, slamming the decision, calling it, quote, political persecution and election interference at the highest level in history. His sons also weigh in in a visceral manner. You'll hear from them later. We learned just moments ago that, former, that the former president is planning to surrender to authorities in New York early next week. Law enforcement here in New York City has already been on high alert for several weeks now after Trump preemptively urged his supporters to protest any indictment. On Friday, Trump even warning of, quote, potential death and destruction if he was charged. I want to get right to Gabe Gutierrez, who's live outside the courthouse in lower Manhattan for us tonight here on Top Story. Gabe, walk us through what you know. Uh, Hi there, Tom. Good evening. As you mentioned, an unprecedented and historic indictment of a former president of the United States. Uh, This came exactly two months to the day that this grand jury was impaneled. And Tom, let me set the scene for you. I'm I'm here in lower Manhattan in front of the courthouse where we have been waiting now for several weeks uh, for news of this possible indictment. You'll recall several uh, weeks ago or earlier this month, former President Trump himself uh, posted on social media that he expected to be uh, arrested last week. That did not come to pass, but now it has. And of course, Tom, as you know, this case centers, we believe, on the alleged hush money payments uh, to that adult film actress Stormy Daniels, who claimed that she had an affair with President Tr- with uh, Donald Trump back in 2006, an affair he denies. This case hinged uh, uh, on a prosecution's main witness, Michael Cohen, which tonight the uh, Trump's attorneys are still... Um, you know, trying to paint him as not credible. So this is what we know, Tom. Um, this has not been unsealed, but according to my colleague, Jonathan Dees, uh, a judge is standing by potentially to unseal this indictment as early as tonight or perhaps tomorrow. But as you said, uh, sources close to President Trump's, uh, former President Trump's attorney say that he's expected now to be arraigned sometime next week. The former president releasing a lengthy statement just a short time ago calling this political persecution and election interference at the highest level in history. He goes on to say that the Democrats have lied, cheated, and stolen in their obsession with trying to get Trump. But now they've done the unthinkable, indicting a completely innocent person in an act of blatant election interference. Again, Tom, we should point out that we do not know the charges here. The many legal experts expect it uh, to be uh, potentially re- related to falsifying business records, which is a misdemeanor. Some legal experts also think that D.A. Alvin Bragg might have sought a lower level felony, but we just do not know at this point. Yeah, again, former President Donald Trump, late today. 
Yeah, there's a lot we don't know. Talk to us about the scene behind you. I mean, obviously, there's always a police presence sometimes outside those courthouses in lower Manhattan. Has it been amplified tonight because of the news that just came down and what you just reported that 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 the indictment may be unsealed as early as tonight? Well, as you can see behind me, there are uh, local, uh, there are officers here. We have been standing by here for the last several weeks. There does seem to be an increased presence uh, here tonight. Uh, last week, there were security barricades that were put up here. Uh, no protesters, though, uh, to speak of. It's relatively quiet here. Again, this news just breaking. But uh, police officers are here on the scene just in case. And again, this news coming late today. The NYPD given instructions uh, to be at the red because the grand jury was voting on this indictment. Well, not only that, Gabe, right? We've heard from the former president who called on his supporters to demonstrate to protest. And because of that, law enforcement at every level Sir, has been put on alert, correct? That's exactly right, Tom. And actually, last uh, week, uh, we heard of a, of a concerning uh, threat that was made on Alvin Bragg's life. Uh, there was a, a letter that arrived here at the, uh, at, the, at the courthouse found in the mailroom with uh, some white powder that turned out to be harmless. But law enforcement sources say that over the past several weeks, the district attorney's office has gotten hundreds of threats, several dozen of them serious. Really an unprecedented uh, attack on a district attorney as a secret grand jury proceeding was underway. So certainly the NYPD tonight is on very high alert. All right, Gabe Gutierrez leading us off from Lower Manhattan. Gabe, stand by for us. I'm sure we're going to check back in with you. I do want to bring in now NBC senior legal correspondent, Laura Jarrett. Laura, I want you to, to react to what we just heard, possibly the judge unsealing tonight. Yeah. Why do you think that would happen so quickly? Do you think it's because the former president is already trying to sow confusion and dissent into the indictment? Perhaps. And it also may be that the district attorney just feels the public has a right to know, given the the person who is at issue here, the potential defendant. Obviously, we have never seen a former or current president of the United States indicted before, and the district attorney may feel the public has a right to know as soon as possible. Um, if the charges are not unsealed, however, that means they will likely uh, stay under wraps for the next couple days until, in fact, um, Trump appears before a judge for that arraignment. We just don't know yet. Laura, it's time. strange. You know, we, we've had this investigation, if you think about it, going on for about five years. Yeah. Tonight, the indictment comes down. Why is it now? Why is it right now? Get our viewers up to speed about what the Manhattan DA saw, what he apparently was able to do with his prosecutors, and why you think the grand jury voted to indict. The timing here is really interesting to think about. Uh, obviously, his predecessor, Cy Vance, the previous district attorney, passed on this case. That's huge. Yeah. Federal investigators passed on this case. They obviously indicted Michael, Michael Cohen, Cohen. Mm -hmm. Trump's fit, former lawyer, former fixer. And he served prison time. And he yep. served prison time for this very right. issue, the campaign contributions going over the limit he pled guilty to that. He served his time for that. But feds passed on this. And so there's always been this question of why would Bragg bring this case back? Internally within the office, it was known as the zombie case because it was this theory that prosecutors kept bringing up because the facts seemed like they might be appealing to a jury. It's easy to get your head around hush money and what happened, but they kept squashing it and killing the zombie case. It was case. untested legal theory based on it, right? And the reason yeah. for that is because in order to raise it to a felony, in order to elevate what is normally a misdemeanor, you have to have have the intent to commit or conceal a second crime. And what we don't know is what is that second crime? And if, in fact, that second crime is a federal campaign violation, that has never happened before. You have never seen a prosecution that hinges on a federal campaign violation, because usually federal prosecutor, prosecutors uh, prosecute federal crimes, not state prosecutors. And so the whole idea of them using that as their hook is what's untested and what's so risky for them doing it now. If and the, judge, fact, and the judge can still decide to toss this out. Absolutely. And you will see Trump's attorneys, I would imagine, I would venture to guess, uh, immediately try to get this tossed out on any number of grounds. They will file a motion to dismiss the indictment, and then a judge will decide whether or not there's probable cause and whether or not it should go forward. As a legal analyst, as a lawyer, from what you've seen so far, and you can tell me we don't have enough information, <laughs> do you think there's enough there? Or you haven't seen enough yet, and we have to wait till this is unsealed. I want to see what the evidence is. I want to see what it's unsealed. But I will say I think it is legally risky if it is what we know right now, which is purely the falsification of the business records, which is so it wasn't the money that Michael Cohen paid. Remember, Trump right. uh, uh, reimbursed That's not Cohen. illegal. You can pay hush money payments. And under state law, yeah. you, can, you can do that. The issue is how it gets documented on the books of the Trump organization. The way we understand it was documented was a note saying legal expenses when it was not legal expenses. That's false. 
But we need to understand, where did that legal expenses go? Did it go anywhere? Was it just internally within the Trump organization? Because if no third party saw it, like a, a tax agency or an insurance company or anyone else, they're going to say there was no intent to defraud because you can't defraud your own business. He is the Trump organization. There's no one to d defraud there. Now, maybe you could try to argue it's defrauding the public, but that's just not the way the law works. Deception is different than fraud. And Trump's attorneys are going to try to gut this on that very issue. On that point, Michael Cohen did admit that he paid this hush money payment, took a loan out, got the money, yeah. paid Stormy Daniels' his lawyer, and then Trump paid him back through legal fees. That's the way it was marked. The Federal Election Commission saw it a different way. Michael Cohen went to prison. But they've been trying to sort of sow doubt with Michael Cohen as a witness. They yes. tried that with Bob Costello, who worked as sort of a legal advisor to Michael Cohen. That didn't work, right? They, they, even though Michael Cohen has written about this and, and they sort of try to downplay his role, that he was just obsessed with Trump and he wanted to be in Trump's circle. He wanted a, a job in the White House. That never happened. Uh, it didn't work. The grand jury still thought there was something right. there. So it, it didn't work, at least at, at the initial stage of the indictment. Now, remember, the threshold to indict is different than the threshold it would be to actually obtain a conviction. Let me right? ask you another question. How do they form the grand jury? Remind our viewers of that. So there's 23 members of society within Manhattan that are randomly polled and have to serve their duty. You need to have 16 people who've actually heard the evidence to be there to vote. And then you need 12 of those 16 of that quorum to actually vote to indict. To get so I spot. think, I think, and I could be wrong, but I think about 80% of Manhattanites voted Democrat in the last presidential election. And this is why the president is saying that this is politically motivated and this is about Bragg's reelection and this is why he's marshalling those types of arguments. But they are instructed to keep politics way out of this and just to listen to the evidence. They are. And, you know, juries take their duties very seriously. I mean, I don't know if you've ever served on a jury, but... They... I, I didn't get picked. I've, I've been asked twice. I didn't get picked for some reason. Well, by yeah. all accounts, look, juries are, are, are trying to do the right thing, and I think we should give them the benefit of the doubt and let the president make his arguments. He's entitled to a defense. He's entitled to say he's done nothing wrong. He's entitled to say these charges should never have been brought. But I think we should be careful to, to not impugn the jury's motives just because of how the Democratic makeup is for the state. Walk us through the timeline now, what you think happens. Okay, say they do in seal it today. How, how far along does this go until a judge gets it in front of their hands and says, okay, we're going to move forward or we're not? In the normal case, it should move pretty quickly. The defendant is usually given the opportunity to surrender, which we understand he is given in this case. He has not been arrested as he had predicted. He's been given the opportunity to come in, surrender, come in for your fingerprints, your mug shots, just like everybody else. Remains to be seen how exactly he would be brought in. Usually people have to go through the front door. There's no back alley entrance. There's no secret garage. Uh, in this case. And so we should see him, although, of course, this is unprecedented. There's a Secret Service concern here. So who knows how far exactly they'll block off the access. He should come in for all of that processing. Then they'll have a period where they actually have to run his fingerprints through the database, and then he'll be arraigned in court. And that part is public, and we should see that. Okay, Laura Jarrett, stand by for us. I do want to bring in Chuck Todd, our political director, moderator, of course, of Meet the Press. Also Meet the Press now here on this network. Chuck, you know, you cannot take out the politics of what's happened today, right? Mm -hmm. This is so historical on so many grounds. Look, a judge could get this. We just heard from Laura here, and it could toss it out, and we could move on, right, to the campaign. But if we right. don't move on, if there is a trial, if this does move forward— Talk to me about what this does to the country, because I do think this is a monumental point in the history of our country if this does move forward. And I don't think by any means can we take this lightly, and this just cannot be shaken off. It's just another thing that happened to former President Trump. Yeah, I think that that's, it really, a lot of it will depend on Donald Trump's actions and reactions to what happens, right? In many ways, how he decides to fire up his supporters about this will will, I think, impact. You're asking, you know, look, I think I, I think the fallout from this is is going to be so enormous, we can't really fully foresee it yet, right? It's almost like um, a building's collapsed, but there's so much rubble, you're not quite sure how, what, how much of it's left, how much isn't. And I think we've got to wait a little bit here. I do think this freezes the Republican presidential campaign for a for until this resolved, you know, uh, I think we were already sort of you could kind of tell the field was sort of shrinking on its own as as more Republicans looked at how hard it was going to be to dislodge Trump from his supporters, to dislodge his supporters from him. And so you already had, I think, a bunch of people thinking about not running anyway. And so the field was already looking smaller. But I think right now it's almost like there's no there's no point in trying to 
score a point against him right now. That seems politically risky. And there's probably no point in trying to do anything because in some ways no one's going to pay attention. So, you know, maybe, you know, start thinking about what you might say in the fall. But if I'm a Ron DeSantis, I might I might punt getting into this race for months. This needs to sort itself out. You know, if I were a, a Republican elected official right now, I'd be holding my powder dry until the fall. I'd want to wait to see what's going to happen here with all of these in, uh, indictments. And if I were thinking about running for president, I might want to wait and see, well, is there going to be another indictment? Will there be one after that? Um, but I think everything is sort of frozen in place here in Republican politics uh, un until at least the fall, until till at least this one sorts itself Chuck, out. Chuck, you know, I, I, I know we are sort of on uncharted ground here. But mm -hmm. the, the earliest Republican primaries are in August. That is right around the no. corner. No, not in August. There's a there, there's a debate in August. I, I'm, sorry, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, debate. Yeah. I, meant, yeah, I misspoke. Yeah. The debate. I'm okay. sorry. The, 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 the first debates, uh, sanctioned yeah. debates are going to be in August. Um, what, what would that mean? I mean, I mean, theoretically, the president, could he be on trial and still take the debate stage? Of course he could. I mean, that's the thing. There's nothing in there that prevents it. Um, I just interviewed one of the, the long shot candidates today, Vivek Ramaswamy, and I asked him if, if, if the former president is indicted, do you think he should keep running? And he said the, the Constitution does, says he can, so he should be able to keep running, you know, meaning and I think he was not wanting to say he, he couldn't or shouldn't uh, on this front because I think there was a fear of alienating his voters, right? All of these candidates are running in a way that they don't want to alienate his supporters, even if even if they don't think he should be the nominee. And I think while he's, you know, here's the thing, it, Donald Trump is gonna fuse all this together. He's gonna fuse his, his defense and his campaign together. It may be bad legal, it may be a bad legal decision to do that, but it may be smart politics for, for him to do it at the same time. You so know, Chuck, I, I think I, that's what we're gonna see. I, I covered the Trump campaign in 2016. I've stayed in, in contact with mm -hmm. a lot of the voters I've met during that time. Right after 2020, a lot of the diehard Trump supporters told me they were ready to move on. They were excited about mm -hmm. candidates like Governor Ron DeSantis. But now I'm also hearing that, that they're sort of frustrated that this is happening to the president. Do you believe at all this will supercharge his campaign? National polls have Trump. Number one, mm -hmm. he's leading. He's clearly the front runner. Some state polls have come out showing Ron yeah. DeSantis is doing a little bit better in, in, in key states. What do you think this does to him in the near term? Well, let's look back. I, we, we do have a, a, a one. We have a small sample size on the Mar-a-Lago uh, FBI search. Um, initially, it helped him. Right. He he uh, unveiled the search, said they were coming after me. And you saw a surge in support. You saw his numbers improve. As we learn more information, it actually hurt them. And you saw a lot of Republicans sort of got some distance from him uh, on that one. I think it all, if, I think for now, I think this does supercharge. I think you'll see a big fundraising number for him that he'll be bragging about over the next 24 to 48 hours. All of that wouldn't surprise me at all. Wouldn't surprise me if you saw a short-term burst uh, uh, in, in more polling that we see come out over the next week or so. But over time, right, as more details come out, um, it, might, it might start to erode, and that's what we saw after Mar-a-Lago. So I don't wanna make any prediction there. I will just simply say what we saw after the search warrant was executed in Mar-a-Lago, an initial burst, but then as more details came out and the totality of what he did came out, we actually started to see some erosion again. So I think the details will matter a lot here in seeing how far he can take this politically. And Chuck, how do you think this affects the current president's timeline on when he announces? I mean, we've been waiting for it all mm -hmm. year. There's been hiccups, right. whether it be classified documents or, or right. other matters, you know, the, the Chinese spy balloon. We, we've been waiting for a lot of, a, a lot of things. Do, do you think this delays the current president's decision to announce? That'll be interesting. Here's, I was sort of led to believe about a month ago, Tom, that the most likely uh, week of the announcement would be uh, the first week of May. I was told that he's on the same timeline that Barack Obama was on for his reelection. Well, Barack Obama's announced his reelection the first week of May uh, and went to a couple states. So if, you know, if he doesn't announce the first week in May, then I will come back here and tell you, Tom, yes, this indictment changed their plans because it's my understanding now that's loosely where they're pointing to next. All right, Chuck Todd, we appreciate all your analysis. Stand by for us as well. We're about to go live to Mar-a-Lago. Before we do that, though, I want to ask a question, Laura. Laura, can the judge 
restrict former President Trump from going to campaign rallies, from entering a debate stage? I mean, will there be, he's going to be a criminal defendant if, if the case yeah. moves forward. Yeah, this is not a case where it's a what you call bail eligible in which you normally see those types of conditions placed on somebody. You know, usually someone actually posts some money in order for them to get out and then they can you know sort of go about their day. I don't think this is a case where you're going to see a judge place conditions on, for instance, his travel or anything like that, especially if he surrenders. He's not seen as a flight risk. It's not a crime of violence. And so I would be very surprised if you saw any sort of conditions on his movement. You, you see someone who could potentially be on trial at the same time campaigning There's to be the next president. There's nothing in the Constitution that prevents somebody who is being currently uh, under investigation yeah. or even convicted from running for office or even becoming president. All right. Dasha Burns is live for us tonight from Mar-a-Lago. Dasha, I know all this news is coming in fast tonight. Uh, you're obviously there watching, standing by for news like this that has happened tonight. What are you hearing from Trump world, if anything at all, and what's happening inside Mar-a-Lago where we believe the current president, uh, the, the former the president is right now. Yeah, we do believe he is at Mar-a-Lago. We haven't yet seen any movement there. I imagine that all of the statements that we are seeing coming uh, from the former president himself, from his lawyers, from his allies, are likely being workshopped in that war room inside uh, Mar-a-Lago uh, at this moment. And look, I'm so glad, Tom, that you had that conversation with Chuck just now, because I don't think we can separate what is happening right now from the backdrop and the context of the 2024 presidential race. While it is so historic to... Uh, uh, now have a former president indicted. It is also historic and significant that a presidential candidate, a third time candidate now, uh, has is going through this because this is now going to impact what happens over the next 18 months. And this is certainly on the mind of Mr. Trump. From the beginning, as we knew that this indictment was possibly coming, you saw him talking about this at his political campaign rally in Waco over the weekend. You saw him talking about it on phone. Fox News and his interview with uh, Sean Hannity, where he was uh, also talking about his his run for president. And he b does believe, and so do his allies, that this will be helpful for him when it comes to his White House bid. He has been rallying the troops, rallying folks around him. And Tom, you saw this uh, in his 2016 campaign, and he's continued to do this over the years, slowly chipping away at these institutions, whether it's the FBI, whether it's uh, the legal system, wh what have you, chipping away at these institutions as, as political weapons, as, as institutions that are targeting him. And now he's able to use that sort of mistrust that he's sown uh, and say, look, don't trust these guys. Listen to me. I'm the one that can tell you what's actually going on here. He's able to have that conversation directly with his supporters. And I'll tell you, I was uh, having phone calls in conversation with some voters this week, I asked them, would an indictment help or hurt Trump in your eyes? Would it make him make you more or less supportive of him? One voter told me that it would make them more supportive, saying that there was no crime committed and therefore it's a complete waste of taxpayer money in New York City. Another saying that who who gives uh, who who cares if he paid someone off? Uh, saying that they feel like whenever there's bad stuff going on with the Biden administration, they just turn the attention to Trump. Others simply saying it does not matter that it shouldn't be the focus uh, so much uh, of, of attention. So. Yeah, yeah, you know, you were, you've been in so many battleground states and you covered Pennsylvania pretty extensively. Yeah. And, and a lot of people blame former President Trump for, for what happened with the Senate race there. Uh, the, the candidate, Dr. Oz, obviously losing that election, an election that Republicans thought they should have won easily. Former President Trump got a lot of blame for what happened to Republicans. It wasn't to use former President Obama's term, a shellacking, right, for the Democrats. They, they somewhat survived during those midterms. Is there frustration from voters just saying it's one thing after another? When are we going to move on from President Trump or, or is he now going to receive from what it sounds like from you a sympathy vote? Well, it, it, it's a mix of both right now. Look, a lot of folks are still saying it's very early. And I hear from a lot of people, Tom, the exhaustion of what, what people call the baggage that comes with Trump, which is the drama, the investigations, the um, sort of constant defending that he has to do, um, the victim card that he often plays. That's words that I hear from from voters themselves. At the same time, they'll they'll say that and then say, but you know what? You know, people do attack him. And that is 
is frustrating. And I do understand, you know, why he sometimes uh, has to defend himself. And so and, and at the same time, they're. For example, look at somebody like Ron DeSantis, right? They say they love what he's done in Florida. They're open to him, but they just don't know him well enough yet. And so uh, some folks are open to seeing, you know, what someone like him could bring to the table, but they still know Trump. They feel like he's a known quantity. And there's just something about him. Once they see him out there again, you know, they were asking themselves these questions before he was really out in the public eye um, as much as he is now. And once they see him once he's at his rallies, once he's on TV again, there's something that just pulls people back in. So again, it's very, very early. Uh, this is by no means set in stone, but there, there is something that's drawing folks back in, especially now when they feel like they need to come, come to his defense at the moment. Tom. Okay. Uh, Dasha Burns at Mar-a-Lago for us. Dasha, we appreciate that. Speaking of defenses, Laura Jarrett, yeah. what, what is the, the former president's defense going to be here? I know, I know one of the defenses that was reported early on was that he was a newcomer to politics. He didn't know about all these election laws. His first time running for office. There was also, hey, this was a Michael Cohen operation. We didn't know what we were doing. We were just paying our lawyer. Will that hold up in court? Yeah, so the whole we didn't know the law is not the strongest defense. He actually has some very strong legal defenses. Again, if in fact the false business records charge is the charge. It requires an intent to defraud. And his lawyers will likely argue that he simply didn't have that intent. This was all Michael Cohen's idea, and Michael Cohen was his lawyer, and he could rely on his lawyer's advice. That's a reasonable defense. You're also going to see them likely try to argue that the statute of limitations has somehow run on this. We've seen him actually posting about that on True Social it, already. Is there, is there truth to that? So there is, in fact, a statute of limitations. That's very common. The problem for him is that he actually left New York, and by leaving New York, that puts a pause on the statute of limitations. Remember, he changes he his residency. Himself. Yes, when he moves his residency down to Florida, I think it's back in 2019, yeah. uh, obviously all the time that he was in the White House, that's what's called tolling the statute of limitations, and it pauses it effectively. So any time that he's out of the state, any time continuously, the statute's on hold. And so, and the thinking was he left New York to avoid prosecution. They wouldn't and come after him, and actually hurt him. Hurt him. Yeah. Okay, we have some new developments coming out from Lower Manhattan. I want to get to Vaughn Hilliard, who also recently interviewed former President Trump on his plane after his campaign rally over the weekend in Waco, Texas. Vaughn, uh, he's joining us live, I think. Vaughn, so I, I understand DA Alvin Bragg, the Manhattan DA, we're getting reports, has just left Lower Manhattan, from what I understand. We're also getting some new reports that apparently the DA's office has reached out to the former president's attorneys about surrendering. Again, we believe that's going to happen early next week. You had a chance to speak to former President Trump on the plane. Talk to us about what he told you about this investigation. Right. I asked a couple of specific questions to Donald Trump about this particular investigation. And the questions were pertaining to Michael Cohen and the reimbursement checks that he wrote to Michael Cohen. To take a step back here, it was the $130,000 that was provided to Stormy Daniels in the two weeks before the 2016 election. Michael Cohen, who was his then fixer, his lawyer, he was the one that actually paid the $130,000 to Stormy Daniels. Donald Trump denies ever knowing that this uh, financial arrangement was made or directing Michael Cohen to do it. To note, federal prosecutors in the past had suggested that Donald Trump did direct Michael Cohen. But the questions that I posed to him were, at what point then did he become familiar with this arrangement? Because throughout 2017, Donald Trump was writing personal checks while in the White House to Michael Cohen, reimbursement checks for that $130,000. Because this, these charges are still sealed, because this indictment is still sealed, and we have not been able to see the contents of them, there are still many outstanding questions as to exactly what prosecutors are charging Donald Trump with. But Donald Trump, when I asked him those questions about that timeline, he refused to directly answer the question of when he became aware. And this could be at the heart of what Alvin Bragg, the Manhattan district attorney, was looking at if, in fact, an election law violation is being, was being considered by this grand jury. Donald Trump, we should note, Tom, has distanced himself from mainstream press. He has avoided direct questions about not only this investigation, but other investigations. And instead, he has called this a witch hunt, prosecutorial misconduct. Again, he had the opportunity to go here and meet the grand jury. Uh, the Manhattan district attorney gave him that opportunity to speak under oath, provide his version of events. Tom, he declined to do so.
All right, Vaughn, we were showing a piece of video that I just want our director, Brett Holy, to roll once again. It was a DA, Manhattan DA, uh, Vance coming out um, of uh, Alvin Bragg, I should say, coming out of from the courthouse there. Uh, again, he has uh, claimed that he had a death threat against him, that somebody wanted to kill him. They sent that in. Uh, the former president has called him an animal as well. It's gotten very ugly between the Manhattan DA and former President Trump. You were sort of in the heart of MAGA country there in Waco, Texas. You were at that rally. The president spoke about this investigation. He spoke about former, uh, uh, his, you know, the, adult, the adult porn star, Stormy Daniels. He, he had a, a, you know, he said something about her looks there. What was the reaction of the crowd when he was talking about mm -hmm. this? And what was the sense you got from the Trump supporters about this investigation? It's notable that Donald Trump, that, that event was more so a campaign to undermine these investigations rather than a political campaign. It was technically his first major rally of his 2024 presidential bid, but focused a majority not only on this case, but the other cases here. And when you talk to supporters around the country, uh, Republican voters who will be going and engaging in the primary process, uh, time and again, I continue to hear a defense of the former president, feeling like he is being unfairly targeted. And to note, you see the likes of Ron DeSantis, Kevin McCarthy, Ronna McDaniel, the RNC chair, notable Republicans, just like we've seen over the last six years, come time and again to Donald Trump's defense. And for Republican voters who I talk to, they say this is not just about an attempt to under, uh, take down Donald Trump. It's an, it's an effort to take down the conservative move, uh, movement, the MAGA movement. And there's a Quinnipiac poll that came out just yesterday, Tom, among Republican voters nationally. They said if Donald Trump were to be charged criminal charges, 75 percent of them believed that that should not disqualify him from being president. It speaks to where at least this Republican base largely remains in defense of Donald Trump. All right. Um, we appreciate all your reporting. Von Hilliard for us. I want to get over to Ken Delanian, uh, our justice correspondent, along with Joyce Vance, a former U.S. Yeah. attorney. Joyce, I'm going to start with you. What, what is your take so far? And I, and I asked this question to Laura Jarrett, but from what you've seen so far, what's been out there in the public, do you think there's enough for a judge to say this case needs to move forward? Or do you think that untested legal theory doesn't hold water? 34 counts. So it's very important to appreciate where we are in the proceedings. We still have not seen the indictment. It is sealed. Until it is unsealed, we will not know exactly which charges Alvin Bragg has brought against the former president. And it won't be until we see those charges and learn a little bit more about the district attorney's evidence that we'll be in a better position to understand whether these charges look viable. I think the reality here, though, is that Alvin Bragg is a savvy prosecutor, former assistant United States attorney in the Southern District of New York, previously worked for New York's attorney general. Now he's is the he, elected Wait, hold on, District Joyce, I just attorney. want to push back this a little bit. Is he, is he a savvy prosecutor? Because he came under a lot of heat from a lot of Democrats when he didn't go after former president over the tax issue. And he decided to move forward with this issue. As we pointed out earlier, the former DA who had that role, Cy Vance, decided to pass up. I, and I'm just, I'm just pushing back on you to get your opinion on that part. I think this is great pushback because it highlights something that we'll all be looking for. What changed? What changed Alvin Bragg's mind? Does he have new witnesses? Does he have new cooperators? Was he able to better corroborate existing witnesses? Something here seems to have changed his calculus about what charges to pursue and whether to pursue them. It's going to be a while. It's going to require more patience from us, and I think patience is something that's in short supply right now. But I would say that as far as typical criminal cases proceed, we'll see a little bit of a different process in the state of New York than we're used to in federal cases. Here we'll see a situation where Trump is very unlikely to be detained pending trial. The judge will look only at whether he's a flight risk and not a danger to the community, which would be the case in the federal system. Very unlikely that we'll see detention. And there will be a limitation on the number of motions he'll be able to raise. He'll raise some of these early challenges that Laura was talking about. Perhaps he'll argue that he's immune for whatever reason. But then we'll be into a posture where they'll, there will be limited discovery and we will get to a trial more quickly than we presumably would in the federal system. Joyce, before I get to Ken, how often do cases move forward once the grand jury indicts? How often do judges say they throw out these cases and how often do they move forward and listen to the grand jury or agree with them? 
It's extremely rare and there are very limited reasons to dismiss a case. You know, you can do it if, if the evidence, even if you construe it in the government's favor, wouldn't support a legal charge. But that's why I think we can look to Bragg's experience as a prosecutor. He has a highly experienced team. It's very unlikely that they would make that sort of a mistake. I know that there are people who have concerns and they center on this notion that what he will charge is the misdemeanor crime of falsifying business records, which gets accelerated to a felony charge if it's committed in connection with or to conceal another crime. And a lot of the concern right now centers on what that other charge will be. Laura talked about the untested route of charges related to a federal election. Prosecutors don't like to bring charges that are untested. You never want to get the conviction and bet the farm that you'll be able to win on appeal on a close call. And that's what this would be. I expect that we will see um, maybe two, maybe more of these sort of accelerator charges, related charges, and that the devil will be in the details. But but it would be wise to withhold judgment until we see the indictment do you, itself. Do you think there's going to be anything in there that's going to surprise us? I would be surprised if we didn't see something surprising. Alvin Bragg has had the benefit of a grand jury investigation that was conducted by both his predecessor, Cy Vance, and by himself. They've had access to witnesses. We even saw David Pecker being recalled to in front of the grand jury for the second time just prior to this indictment. Sometimes as a prosecutor, you get a last minute cooperating witness when you get close to charges. Sometimes new documentary evidence is uncovered. If there are, you know, for instance, transcriptions or, or tapes that further corroborate witnesses. And that right now is in Alvin Bragg's hands and only Alvin Bragg's hands. It's important to note that what we're hearing about anticipated charges comes from witnesses, perhaps comes from the Trump camp. It does not come from prosecutors. They are not permitted to talk about grand jury proceedings. They are secret as a matter of law. Prosecutors will try their case in the courtroom. All right, Choice fans, we appreciate all your perspective. I want to get over to Ken Delaney. And Ken, give us a sense here. I mean, th there's been a lot of reporting and some mixed reporting about what we actually will see, what actually will happen to former President Trump. I know some people think he will be fingerprinted. There have been reports out there that, that they may have his fingerprints on file because he filed for a gun permit in New York. Will he be handcuffed? Will the public see that? Will he want the public to see that? From your reporting, talking to all your sources at, at various levels of law enforcement, what's, what's our firmest understanding tonight about what's what's going to happen to him when he turns himself in? Well, Tom, I think our reporting is that he will be fingerprinted and he will be swabbed for DNA. But the question of whether he'll be handcuffed is up in the air because Donald Trump is under Secret Service protection. And presumably his Secret Service detail would follow him through the process of being booked. Um, but whatever happens with the, in this regard, it's, it's, it's going to be a remarkable and historic moment. The first former president ever uh, indicted for any crime whatsoever. And, you know, I'm standing in front of the federal district court here in Washington, D.C., where two other investigations into President, former President Trump are ongoing, run by special counsel Jack Smith. And, and I've been wondering tonight how this turn of events is going to affect those other cases. And I think it cuts both ways, Tom, because, you know, look, at the end of the day, this is a case, and we don't know what this case is yet. Joyce is making very good points. We, we're all assuming it's a, a very narrow case, but it could be more than that. But but nonetheless, this is a case brought by an elected Democratic district attorney in a liberal city in a blue state. Uh, the same could not be said about Jack Smith, who's a career prosecutor, the special counsel here working for the Justice Department, independent of the Biden administration. Had had those cases, those federal cases, assuming they are moving towards indictment, had any of those indicted first, it would be harder for even a moderate governor like a Glenn Youngkin, I just saw a statement from him of Virginia, to criticize that as a political prosecution. That's what they're doing in New York. And so there's a there's a risk that it taints the entire effort here. It taints these other cases uh, against uh, these these federal cases that are moving forward. At the same time, it, there's an argument that it takes a little bit of the pressure off. Merrick Garland at some point may have to make a momentous decision as to whether to improve a fe approve a federal indictment against a former president um, by the administration of his potential opponent in the next election. That's a huge decision, and it would have been a bigger decision had it been the first indictment. Now it's, it, it couldn't be the first indictment. And so 
Uh, yeah. As this federal investigation proceeds, and it's going in a very dangerous direction for Donald Trump, I think those factors are weighing on. This, this could be the first of several unprecedented days we've seen in the history of this country. Before you go, Ken, and briefly, I know you, you, your sources are, are, are deep within the FBI and other law enforcement organizations in this country. How serious is, is the fear right now that, that there's going to be something really bad, something really big, just, just maybe even, something even violent uh, once the president, uh, former president turns himself in? Well, look, there's deep concern about that, Tom. There's been a lot of planning around it uh, between federal agencies and the NYPD. But one thing that when I talk to law enforcement officials about this, they often mention is that the NYPD is not the Capitol Police. The NYPD has an intelligence division that was created by the CIA after 9-11. If there are far-right extremists coming over the bridges into Manhattan, they will know about it. They will be deployed and ready to deal with whatever the threats are. And so many of the sources I have uh, who talk about this are concerned about a possible level, enhanced level of violence. And we saw that that threat against, and many threats against the DA Alvin Bragg, uh, but they are also sort of confident that between the federal authorities and the NYPD that they can handle the threat. Tom. Ken Delaney for us tonight. Ken, we appreciate it. We're going to take a very short break. We're going to have much more on former President Trump being indicted tonight. Stay with us. Ready to unlock our true crime mysteries? Try Dateline Premium on Apple Podcasts. You'll get early access to originals, plus bonus content, and everything is ad-free. So head to Apple Podcasts now to subscribe. The day's biggest political stories, with trusted insight and expert analysis. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the press now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Welcome back to a special edition of Top Story. We, of course, are following that monster breaking news tonight, the indictment of former President Trump here in Manhattan by the Manhattan DA, a grand jury indicting the president tonight. And possibly we may even see the indictment unsealed by a judge later tonight. But we're still waiting on that. Laura Jarrett, our chief legal analyst, is joining us tonight. And Laura, I, I want to ask you, I, I Pretend you are the DA tonight, if you will. Your key witness is Michael Cohen, somebody who has been convicted of this crime that we're talking about right now, convicted of perjury for lying to Congress. Uh, a, a lot of people who've worked with Michael Cohen, who had to deal with him as reporters, may, may describe him as despicable. Somebody who was enamored, obsessed with President Trump during this time. He later, of course, turned on him and testified in the grand jury against him. Somebody who may have monster credibility issues. That's number one, right? Number two, this alleged relationship with Stormy Daniels 
scandals happened in 2006. The payments, 2016. So we're talking about there's been a length of time that's happened since then. With all of that, does that worry you at all still presenting this case, or do you think prosecutors would still have enough to get the president? If I am the DA, look, it's not going to give me a lot of comfort to have Michael Cohen be my key narrator, but what other choice do I have? He is really the linchpin here because he's the one who actually makes the payment. He's the material witness to all of the key events. Now, perhaps the CFO, Alan Weisselberg, is, also has a role to play here, but if I haven't managed to get him to flip so far, so right. far then I need Cohen. And look, you know, prosecutors are very well versed in having people who perhaps have seedy backgrounds, right? They always say you don't necessarily get a nun or a saint to be your key witness. And you can explain some of that. The problem is for Michael Cohen is that his whole sort of disposition right now is saying that I was unfairly targeted. I was part of a political prosecution by the Justice Department. He can't really have it both ways. Either he has to say I have come clean and everything that I said before was a lie, but now I'm telling the truth. Or he's saying, no, I was targeted and all along I did nothing wrong. He doesn't really get to have it both ways. And it's part of why you saw prosecutors try to urge his attorney not that long ago, please keep him off of TV because he's talking out of both sides of his mouth. Now, having said all of that, they need in New York, you can't just have a witness testify. You actually have to have some other cooperation. So there's got to be either documents or some other evidence that they're going to be able to use to support their case here. It can't only be Cohen alone that they're using to make this case. And that they have David Pecker as what we know to be possibly the last witness to testify yes. is huge because he was alleged to orchestrate the entire catch and kill, the payment, exactly. putting, putting the, the dots together. And actually received uh, you know, word from the former president as far as the reporting is out there that the president wanted help suppressing these stories and Pecker was a willing participant in this whole scheme. All right, Laura, stand by for us. I do want to get back down to Florida. Former representative and NBC News analyst Carlos Corbello joins us live along with Puck senior political reporter, Tara Palmieri. Tara, I want to start with you tonight. Tara, you're, you are so sourced within the Trump world, and I, and I also know that you've done a lot of reporting on Governor Ron DeSantis' political build-out for mm -hmm. his presidential campaign. T -t Tell us straight tonight, and I, I know that this news is very fresh, so maybe sometimes it's hard to, to reach people mm -hmm. when news breaks. What is the sense within the DeSantis world and Trump world tonight? Well, I think um, the DeSantis world made a calculation that they said that they would not assist in any way in the extradition. I think this was always a big question mark. Uh, would he assist the authorities to extradite Trump? If he did, um, you know, if he actually did, that would not play well with the MAGA base that he's still trying to win over. Um, if he tried to actually, um, if he tried, if he helped resist the arrest, if Trump didn't want to actually turn himself in, which it seems like he will, you know, that might actually have play political points for him. But at the end of the day, Ron DeSantis is a lawyer, and I think it's against his instincts to ultimately, you know, uh, resist law enforcement. And it's a risky move as a governor. Um, he could be held under contempt as well. So we know that Trump is turning himself in, and I suspect that Trump doesn't want Ron DeSantis to win any political points by being his savior and protecting him either. And I think he was sort of hoping that Ron would um, assist law authorities um, in the extradition, and he could use that as another example that Ron DeSantis is a, a rhino, as he says, a Republican in name only. You've heard that from his son already. They said that the, the statements against um, Alvin Bragg weren't forceful enough from Ron DeSantis. And in his latest statement, he's sort of echoing Donald Trump's language that this is a this is a weaponization of government, a political witch hunt. So I think there's just a lot of political pressure on Ron DeSantis to keep Trump's base happy, to try to win them over. And so he has to walk a tightrope. Now, Donald Trump has long seen this coming. I think his lawyers were probably notified last week. That's why you heard about the indictment. And I'm sure they're going to try to use it to help corral, corral the support ahead of the primary. And I think it will. I think he will ultimately win the Republican primary because of this. But I don't think it does him any favors in a general election where overwhelmingly, you know, polls show that these voters do not want to vote for an indicted president. They don't like the drama. They didn't like January 6th. They don't like the hush money payment. And I'm talking about college educated suburban women who tend to decide elections. They don't like this. So while it may make him the nominee, it's actually a blessing for Joe Biden if he's up against Donald Trump, because so many of these swing voters that voted for Biden in 2020 
they still don't like what they're getting with Trump. And this is just a reinforcement of that. So I think at the end of the day, it's not good for the Republican Party. Carlos, talk to us about Florida. Talk to us about what, what the people that you still work with, the people you still talk to within the Republican Party. H- how do you think this affects Trump? Do you think people will, will at first have sympathy for him, but then it'll be like, God, this is one more thing, one more notch on the belt of the reasons why we should get rid of Trump? Well, Tom, this certainly gives Trump the opportunity to flex with his base voters, as Tara said. I mean, when you look at what's happened here, it's extraordinary. Donald Trump has been crisscrossing the country, slandering Ron DeSantis for weeks. And tonight, Ron DeSantis was compelled to issue a statement essentially backing the former president, maybe not directly, maybe not forcefully, but certainly checking the box with the president's supporters, which make up a majority of the Republican base. So while a lot of voters for some time have been talking about the idea of dumping Trump in favor of someone else, someone new, someone fresh, this siege mentality that this whole indictment creates, uh, the perception that it could be politically motivated is certainly strengthening him here. And Tom, there are echoes here of Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky Uh, a couple decades ago. Uh, That scandal ended up helping Bill Clinton because the perception was that the other side at the time, the Republicans were being too forceful, too aggressive in coming after him. Donald Trump could benefit from a similar dynamic right now. So in the short term, it's gonna be very good for him. I certainly do agree with Tara. I think in the long term, this is a big distraction for Republicans. And as we've seen uh, recently, what's good for Donald Trump is not good for the Republican Party. We saw that in the 2022 elections, the candidates that Donald Trump supported and who supported his dishonesty about the 2020 election were defeated in swing state after swing state. So good news for Donald Trump short term politically tonight, a difficult road ahead for the Republican Party. By the way, House Republicans today passed their number one priority, H.R. 1, an energy bill. No one is going to be talking about it. Carlos, before we go, you know, there were a lot of Democrats in the Midwest or, or people who voted for President Obama that switched their vote over to President Trump in 2016. What do you think happens to those voters when they see this? Do you think this is one more thing that, that, that makes them sick of the president? Or do you think they have sympathy for him? Or do you think they just they, they just vote opposite party and they're, and they're sick of President Biden and they'll go with Trump if he's a nominee? Well, Tom, I think that for working class voters, uh, they actually identify with Donald Trump. Again, this siege mentality, the idea that the left is against them, is trying to take over the country, is trying to suppress uh, people who are conservative. That resonates with a lot of working class voters in the Midwest where uh, these kinds of messages and these kinds of events are a huge turnoff is in suburban districts uh, outside of major cities all over the country. These are the districts uh, that uh, you know gave Democrats back the House in 2018 because they were sick of Donald Trump. These are the people who put Joe Biden in office and who rejected Trump candidates in 2022. A big yeah. priority for congressional Republicans these days is to win back the suburbs. Today's events do not help them with suburban voters. Carlos Cubero, Tara Palmieri, we thank you so much for joining Top Story tonight. We're going to be right back. A verdict just reached in the Gwyneth Paltrow case. Stay with us. Welcome back to this special edition of Top Story. We continue to follow that breaking news. Former President Trump indicted. But we've also gotten news on another court case we've been following, the latest in the Gwyneth Paltrow ski crash trial. The eight-person jury just found Gwyneth Paltrow not at fault for a 2016 collision with another skier. NBC's Dana Griffin has the latest. 
Tonight, a jury reaching a verdict in the Gwyneth Paltrow ski crash trial, awarding her one dollar. Was Gwyneth Paltrow at fault? No. What percent of the fault do you assign to Terry Sanderson? 100 percent. In closing arguments today, Sanderson's team vying for sympathy. It's one of Terry's status problems is loss of executive function. Okay. He cannot organize and manipulate his life to do things like he used to do. It's a status thing. And that's why part of him is still up there on that mountain. While Paltrow's team questioned Sanderson's fitness to be skiing in the first place. His skis are coming in between her. It's because he's le looking with his one, by the way, he has like half an eye because he has a cataract in the left eye. Hearing shot. Sometimes we have to give things up, especially when we're 76 years old. I'm sorry. The defense team recalling Sanderson to the stand, casting doubt on the extent of his injuries by questioning his adventurous travels after the crash. Floated down the Amazon? Uh, yes, I guess so. Costa Rica. Did you do a zip line? Same trip, yes. Did you go to Europe? Visit Netherlands, Germany, Switzerland, Italy, France, Belgium. With my daughter, Jenny, yes. Sanderson initially sued Paltrow for just over $3 million, but amended the complaint to 300000 He alleges Paltrow crashed into him on the slope, leaving him with a brain injury and fractured ribs. Just simply gliding down the hill, not making turns, and uh, always on the right side. And the silence was broken with a hysterical scream. The Oscar-winning actress countersued for $1 plus attorney fees, saying Sanderson was the one who crashed into her, describing it as a, quote, full body blow. Her attorney calling the claims, quote, utter BS. And two skis came between my skis, forcing my legs apart, and then there was a body pressing against me. Okay, Dana, I understand Gwyneth Paltrow has a statement out tonight. And also, will she get those attorney fees? Well, that's going to be decided a little bit later. The judge made it very clear during the uh, instructions that he gave to the jury that they can only decide the $1 damages. Now, had this been reversed and they cited in favor for Sanderson, they would have had to come up with an exact dollar amount. But here's her statement that she um, sent through her attorney. It reads, I felt that acquiescing to a false claim compromised my integrity. I am pleased with the outcome and I appreciate all of the hard work of Judge Holmberg and the jury and thank them for their thoughtfulness in handling this case. Tom? Okay, Dana Griffin for us tonight. Dana, we appreciate that update. When we come back, the latest on the indictment of former President Trump, our legal analyst Danny Savalos on deck, the memo just sent to the NYPD, plus the new statement from DA Alvin Bragg. Stay with us.
We continue to cover the breaking news. Former President Trump indicted by a grand jury in Manhattan. I want to get right down to NBC's Gabe Gutierrez in lower Manhattan. Gabe, I know you have some breaking news about a memo just released by the NYPD. Yes, uh, yes, we do, Tom. But first, I want to say that the DA just left here a short time ago under a heavy security presence. We have a new statement from him saying that his office has contacted President, uh, former President Trump's attorneys. Now, we do not know exactly when the arraignment will happen, but according to Trump attorney Joe Takapina, that is expected sometime early next week. But we are learning of that new memo sent to NYPD officers just this afternoon, ordering all uniformed officers to be prepared to be on duty at 7 a.m. tomorrow. Tom, this is an unprecedented situation. The NYPD on alert after the indictment of a former president. Yeah, clearly the security situation still on the minds of the NYPD and really law enforcement all across the country. We're going to have to wait and see what exactly happens and when the former president makes his way over to Manhattan. All right, Gabe Gutierrez, we appreciate you and all your reporting. We thank everyone who joined in on the special edition of Top Story tonight. We thank you for watching the show. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. Much more news, including a lot on this breaking news on the way. And we begin tonight with the kind of breaking news the country has never seen before. Donald Trump is now the first former president to be indicted. Now, the exact criminal charges are still under seal, but we do know that this case centers around a 2016 hush money payment to former porn star Stormy Daniels. A Manhattan grand jury voted to indict Trump earlier this evening. Again, the indictment is still under seal by the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, but it's expected to be announced in the coming days. And it did not take long for Trump to respond, saying in part, quote, Never before in our nation's history has this been done. I believe this witch hunt will backfire massively on Joe Biden. We are going to throw every last one of these crooked Democrats out of office so we can make America great again. Meanwhile, a lawyer for Stormy Daniels says, quote, the hard work and conscientiousness of the grand jurors must be respected. Now let truth and justice prevail. No one is above the law. And remember, uh, this is one of several legal troubles facing the former president. Trump is still facing criminal investigations for his role in attempting to overturn the 2020 presidential election. NBC News correspondent Dasha Burns joins us live from West Palm Beach, Florida. Dasha, uh, we've seen people show up in support of a uh, former President Trump soon after he said he was going to get arrested. Uh, what's going on out there right now? Well, Gotti, right now, no movement at Mar-a-Lago where we believe the president and former president is uh, at this moment. That's where we believe that these statements are coming from, a war room uh, somewhere in there right now. Look, this is a stunning moment, not only because this is a former president getting indicted, but also let's not forget because Mr. Trump certainly has not forgotten that this is also a current candidate, a third time candidate for uh, the White House, for the presidency. And this context, the backdrop of the 2024 campaign is also critical right now. And you're right, this is a moment where his allies are rallying around him. We've heard from uh, his children, Eric Trump, uh, posting on Truth Social, calling this third world prosecutorial misconduct. We just heard from Senator Josh Hawley on Fox News saying that this is a demonstration of raw power, saying, I think the Democrats know this has nothing to do with the law. And these are the sorts of sentiments that we have been expecting from Trump world, right? He's been sort of doling this sort of messaging out over the course uh, of the last week since we've uh, had a, a sense that this kind of uh, that this indictment was, in fact, uh, likely to come at some point here. Uh, but look, we are still not sure what the charges are going to be. Uh, we're still waiting for that. We don't know when when we will find out um, and we we don't know the exact exact uh, timing for the arraignment yet, but this is certainly uh, a, a massive moment here, Gotti. When it comes to a possible arraignment, do we at least know when he's going to surrender? I've seen something along the lines of possibly early next week. 
Yeah, two sources are telling NBC News that we uh, are looking at early next week uh, for a, a possible arraignment here. And imagine this, Gotti, when we're, we're putting this into historical context and we're, we are TV news here, right? We think about the visuals that we are going to see. This is a former president. He will be traveling from Mar-a-Lago here to New York City, from the airport to uh, a courthouse in New York City. This is likely to be a major media moment uh, filled with history, filled with uh, celebrity. This this is not going to be uh, a small affair. So we we better all prepare for for that day as soon as we know what that day is. Gotti. Sasha Burns, thanks so much. NBC News legal analyst and former federal prosecutor Glenn Kirshner also joins us. Glenn, uh, when this indictment is unsealed, uh, what are you going to be looking for? So uh, Donald Trump will have to go through all of the normal procedures. He will be booked. I don't happen to think there will be a perp walk. I don't think he'll be arrested. I think it will be a voluntary surrender. So he'll arrive at the police station with his defense team in tow. I suspect the police will uh, process him, will fill out a whole bunch of police paperwork about his biographical information, his address, his employment information, which seems almost silly because we all sort of know and that's publicly available information but then they will fingerprint him they will book him and then he'll be presented in court for his first hearing which is called an arraignment after you've been indicted um, the arraignment involves a judge or the clerk of the court reading the indictment to the defendant and moving forward donald trump will now you know have earned the title defendant they'll read the defendant the charges that have been indicted against him unless his legal team waves reading of the charges. After that, the question will turn to what, if anything, should be done with Donald Trump pending trial? Should the judge put any sorts of conditions on Donald Trump? It's extraordinarily unlikely that he would be detained pending trial, but a judge could set conditions like no travel outside the United States, voluntary surrender of his passport, perhaps some restriction on his abilities to speak in a way that might incite imminent lawless action. We know what happened on January 6th. I don't think anybody wants to see that happen again. And he has already posted things like protest, 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 take our nation back, uh, which he said when he thought he was going to be indicted a couple of Tuesdays ago. And a judge could take up the question of whether there should be some restriction on his speech or his posts to avoid you know, the risk to the public and also to avoid poisoning the well of the potential jury pool. So I think those are some of the things that we might see discussed at the arraignment hearing. And Glenn, all of this is supposed to be secret. I mean, the grand jury is one of the most secretive parts of our legal process. I gotta say, this is starting to look like a spectacle, but, but what are the things that we're not seeing on how the grand jury works in that room? Uh, how was this indictment handed down? What did it look like today behind those closed doors? So ordinarily, Gotti, when we're done presenting our evidence to the grand jury, we will uh, propose to them the charges that we believe are supported by the evidence. We'll read them the legal elements of each charge. We will sometimes make a summary argument about why we believe the evidence they've seen, the witness testimony, the documents, the photographs, the records, et cetera, why we believe the evidence supports indicting the defendant or the target of the investigation on a number of charges, and then we leave the grand jury room. Nobody's permitted to be in there while the grand jury is deliberating on charges. I've stood outside grand jury rooms many, many a day waiting for them to hand out that vote sheet to see whether they returned a true bill, they indicted the target of the investigation, or a no true bill, and they decided there was insufficient evidence. So that's the process that this grand jury apparently just completed. And Glenn, just a check of the, the docket here. This is the one grand jury that we know of, but there, there are other cases, right? Oh, there sure are. You know, Jack Smith, special counsel, is investigating both the Mar-a-Lago documents uh, matter and the insurrection, the January 6th matter. And um, and of course, Fawny Willis down in Georgia, the Fulton County prosecutor, is investigating uh, potential solicitation of election fraud and related charges by Donald Trump. So this is uh, and I have always said, Gotti, that no prosecutor wants to be the first to take this maiden legal voyage to indict a former president of the United States. 
I do tend to think we might see the dominoes begin to fall. And other prosecutors may feel, if not emboldened, they may feel like, OK, the time is right for us to move forward in our investigation. So we'll all have to stay tuned. Yeah, uncharted territory. Glenn, thanks so much for joining us. And our good friend Hallie Jackson joins us now to talk about what this means for the 2024 presidential election. Hallie, uh, how soon can we expect Trump to start raising massive amounts of money off of all this? Gotti, I'll tell you what, he already is. We saw within minutes of the news breaking about this indictment, maybe an hour into it when it first began being reported, the fundraising emails already starting to go out. Remember, this is something that the former president has been doing, his campaign has been doing for a while now, ever since the sort of legal drumbeat of the potential for charges against him first started to happen. They have framed this as essentially political persecution against him. They are looking to raise money off of it. They are raising money off of it. And that has already begun even tonight. Got it. And Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is already weighing in. He tweeted this earlier. Yeah. Florida will not assist in an extradition request given the questionable circumstances at issue with this Soros-backed Manhattan prosecutor and his political agenda. Uh, so what is, I mean, you've, you've got kind of like a Washington crystal ball. What does that tell you about 2024? I sure do not. Let me just set the record straight on that one, my friend. But here's what I'll tell you is it, this is an interesting statement from DeSantis. And, and I had been looking as we were on the air with our special coverage to see specifically what he would say. Because remember, mm -hmm. he is the Republican that is widely considered to be kind of right there with Donald Trump as far as the front runners in the 2024 campaign. And no, Ron DeSantis has not officially announced yet, although it seems to be only a matter of time. And here he is coming out and essentially backing the line from the Trump campaign that this is, in their view, weaponization of the justice system. When he says Florida will not assist in this extradition, in an extradition request, it's a moot point, right? Because Donald Trump's attorneys have said he's going to go turn himself in uh, early next week, I believe is what Joe Tacopina is telling our team here. Two sources familiar also confirm that it is likely that Mr. Trump will surrender himself. There's not going to need to be an extradition. So like Don, Ron DeSantis coming out after that and saying I won't comply with an extradition, but it's a, it's a bit of a moot point. Point being, though, you are not seeing DeSantis go after Donald Trump. And that is probably strategically smart from the point of DeSantis because you don't want to alienate. If you're running for the Republican presidential primary, you don't want to alienate Donald Trump's base of support because that is a critical base when it comes to the GOP primary. Ron DeSantis has to walk a line between looking to peel off those Trump voters to make them DeSantis voters without alienating them altogether. Gotti. I mean, not to read between the lines, but you've seen the DeSantis poll numbers. It's funny, uh, when, you were, when you were reporting on the network a little bit earlier, right before you, I believe, uh, Chuck Todd, and I don't know if, if Governor DeSantis was watching this, but Chuck Todd was talking about how Ron DeSantis might just keep a very low profile as all this plays out yeah. ahead of 2024. Then all of a sudden, uh, I saw that tweet, the tweet that we just talked he about that came out. So you're, you're seeing this as kind of a more of a, a political ploy. Uh, instead of a, an actual talk of extradition. Totally. He had to say something, Gotti, meaning DeSantis had to say something. And the reason why I say that is this. After um, former President Trump, do you remember like 10 days ago, two weeks ago, he put out this truth social on his platform saying something about he was going to be arrested or charged that following Tuesday, right? That was big news mm -hmm. that the former president was suggesting that. It, we had thought perhaps an indictment was getting close because the Manhattan District Attorney had asked Mr. Trump, offered basically to come testify to the grand jury. That typically happens towards the end of the case. Fine. So Donald Trump says this. That weekend, right, the, in the days between Donald Trump saying that and then that Tuesday, all of these Republicans came out and said, you know, this is political persecution, et cetera. They sort of backed up the line that the Trump campaign was saying, except for Ron DeSantis, who didn't say anything for like several days. And in the course of those several mm -hmm. days, he was getting hammered by some on the right for the silence there right, for not saying anything. So it is, to me, not surprising that he would come out now, and as we are hearing from Nikki Haley and Glenn Youngkin and other people whose names are often mentioned for 2024, or in the case of Haley, somebody who is an official candidate already, it is not surprising to me that we're gonna hear from these folks. Mike Pence is gonna be over on CNN a little later on tonight, I believe. Like, again, gonna be asked, gonna have to talk about it. The question is, how much oxygen does this suck up in the 2024 campaign? So if you're Ron DeSantis mm -hmm. or if you're Mike Pence, are you kind of leaning back and you're going, hey, I don't have to jump to get into this race because this is going to be 
the headline, right, for the period of the next who, who knows how long. And, Hallie, we were just showing some video from, from his rally in Waco. Yeah. Uh, talking about the indictment, do you expect him to get back on the road pretty quickly with everything that's going on right now? Yes. Uh, we, we saw him in Waco, and he, I was told before that uh, rally by a source familiar with it that the, pre the former president was expected to lean into these investigations against him, to go after them, to go after the Manhattan DA. He sure did, and there is not any doubt in my mind, frankly, um, and I don't have the reporting specifically on the next rally, but I would imagine, based on past precedent from what we've seen from Donald Trump, he will certainly do that again and again. Remember, this, this, he's in front of crowds, these rally crowds, who are very loyal to him, who back him. He loves being out there for rallies. We know that, that this is somebody who likes that feedback immediately and viscerally from a crowd that, frankly, uh, adores him for the people that are coming out to those rallies. So uh, I don't see that stopping, Gotti, and I think that as we saw again and again, starting in 2016 and all the way through uh, his time at the White House there, he goes out to these campaign style rallies and he attacks the investigations against him. There have been other investigations previously. That is what he's done. And I imagine that that's his roadmap now for the next several months. It's going to be a very long year. Allie Jackson, thanks so much.